Wendigos are basically forest necromorphs, aren't they? Oh, hey, welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and you can follow me on Twitter, at Dark Prevails, where I dream of trying a bison steak and make covers to books that don't exist. Today, I've got a huge compilation of allegedly real Wendigo sightings that will either make you hungry for some human steak or make you twitch at the sight of every branch that looks a little bit too much like a set of antlers. Enjoy, and be sure to send me your scary stories at darkstories.org so I can narrate them on this show. I'm looking for stories about unexplained things seen in state parks or encounters with alleged demons. If you want more scary content like this, check out eeriecast.com. Now, let's begin. Followed from Terrible Fate 89. I used to camp in the Ozarks. Camping was a hobby of mine, but it isn't so much anymore. This experience kind of ruined it for me. Have you ever been so traumatized or scared of something, you avoid anything that reminds you of it? That's how I feel about this. To this day, I don't know what it was. A few years ago, I was camping alone in the Ozarks of Missouri, pretty close to the border of Arkansas. The weather was dreary, it had been pouring rain for hours, and the forecast, according to my phone, said that the rain would keep coming for the next couple of days. I was alone as I usually was, something I regret now. The thing was, I didn't really have many friends that enjoyed camping like I did, so I was usually always alone. But now I regret not asking someone, anyone, if they wanted to go camping. It started the first evening, when I was still walking but considering pitching my tent somewhere. Rain trickled down around me on the trees and on the ground. Tiny little streams of water began to form on the dirt and rocks. I was hoping I wasn't going to get flooded away, but I was on top of a hill, so it should flow down and I should have nothing to worry about, I told myself. In the midst of the raindrops, I began to hear something else. They were light, uneven footsteps, like the steps of a small but curious person. Someone who was cautious, perhaps they didn't want to be heard, or they wanted to keep their distance. At first, I assumed this was some sort of animal keeping an eye on me, maybe a brave deer keeping watch, or even a mountain lion trailing me to make sure I move out of its territory. If it was a mountain lion, but they were stalking me, considering me as prey, I wasn't too worried as I had ample protection. I didn't want to shoot it, and the gunshot at least should scare it away if it came down to that, I thought. I never stopped walking. I continued going, pretending that I didn't hear the noise, but keeping a close ear on it. Whatever it was, it seemed to be keeping the same distance between us. I never heard any breathing or growling or anything like that. I was hoping that I would lose it before pitching my tent, I didn't like the idea of this stalker knowing where I was sleeping for the night. Then something happened. From the same direction of those footsteps came a terrible high-pitched scream, one that sounded like it was approaching me rapidly. All at once I turned around, my skin covered in goosebumps and my heart racing. Just as I turned around, the screaming stopped. There was nothing out of place, just ever-darkening woods. Rain dripping from tree branches, and leaves and rocks on a faint forest path. I continued looking around, calming my breathing, and somehow I convinced myself that it was some sort of crazy bird that had swooped past me, making a weird noise. As I continued walking, I noticed the footsteps had disappeared, and for a while, I was thankful for that. About an hour later, I'd found a camping spot under an especially large walnut tree that seemed to have most of its leaves intact. I took advantage of this added layer of shelter and set up my tent under it. I was unable to make a fire and keep it going with how wet the ground had become. So instead, I cast a tarp under the lowest hanging branch I could find on the tree, which was luckily close to my tent. I propped it up on another branch. Beneath it on the ground, I turned on my stove which was portable and used a small container of butane. 
I got some water boiling, then prepared some hot cocoa, sipping on it to help me keep warm. It was a blessing that night that the year had been particularly warm, as previous falls had been unforgiving. After my cup of hot cocoa and reading true crime forums on my phone, I fell asleep under a blanket in my tent. Before long, I woke up. Of course, it was still raining outside, but I had to pee. I stepped out of the tent with my boots on and with my coat on. I positioned myself under the tarp I'd set up before for the stove, and I did my business. When I was done, I zipped up, and I turned back to the tent. When I paused, I saw something further up the path, maybe 20 yards past my tent. It was small, pale gray, and it looked like a person. Why would someone be out here in the middle of the rain without any clothes, I wondered. I kept staring at this pale figure, trying to figure out what it was. I couldn't see a face, and it was still faint from that distance thanks to the rain and trees. I must have sat there staring at it, waiting for it to move to signal that it was in fact a person, or at least alive. But the entire time I stood there, watching, it never moved. After a while, I finally convinced myself that I was just seeing something else in the woods. Perhaps a strange rock, or a tree that was shaped like a person, if you looked at it at just the right angle. I shook my head and yawned. I stepped forward, leaning down to crawl back into my tent. I took one last glance at the figure before crawling in, and I'm not sure if I'm glad I did that or regretful, because when I did, the figure moved. Those chills and goosebumps came back with a vengeance. I was not, in fact, alone out here, and what I saw, I couldn't see any fur on it. And I couldn't for the life of me think of an animal out here that was that big and furless. Well, except for a person. But that's exactly what I was afraid of. Why was there a nude person all the way out here in the middle of the rain? And why had they been watching me? I stood straight back up and I called out to them. Hello? No answer. Freaked out like anyone else would be in this situation. I readjusted my tent so that the opening faced that direction. I wanted to be able to keep an eye on it, and I wanted to be able to stay in my tent throughout the night. After readjusting it, I was also able to reach my stove from the entrance. So I stayed up, making three different pots of coffee throughout the night, downing them one after the other to help me stay awake. I didn't see any further movement that night. Come morning... I was exhausted. Coffee only gets you so far to keep you awake. Once the sun was fully in the sky, I dozed off for an hour or two. There's no way I could keep hiking if I didn't get a little bit more sleep. After I woke up, I packed my things back up and continued walking. I was still a little bit creeped out, not entirely convinced that what I saw was something natural. And I knew it wasn't a dream, I wasn't going to sit there and tell myself it was a nightmare. I could tell dreams and nightmares from reality. I kept on walking, faster than the day before. I swear I covered twice the distance I was supposed to. And come nightfall, I hadn't seen or heard anything weird or strange. But I wasn't about to let myself forget what I saw. I made more coffee and stayed up looking at my phone, turning off my blue light filter. Blue light keeps you awake, so I've heard. So I always turned on the blue light filter, or I would download an app for it, on any phone I had. This occasion was different. I didn't want to sleep. So bring on the blue light. I stayed up reading forums, and maybe I shouldn't have been googling this, but I was looking up strange stories in the woods. Not for fun, but I wanted to see if other people had seen weird things in the forest. Every minute or so, I would look up scanning my surroundings. Unfortunately, that night was far darker than the night before. It was hard to see much of anything outside the tent. However, the rain that night brought with it lightning, and about every 20 seconds or so, 
the woods would be entirely lit up by lightning strikes, some distant, some too close for comfort. But honestly, I wasn't very worried about the lightning. I just wanted to be sure that that thing or person didn't come back. Don't get me wrong, I had a gun. That made me feel a bit more secure about this situation. But I would have to be awake to use it, and at that point in time, I was beginning to doze off. Eventually, full-fledged sleep took hold. When I woke up, the rain had stopped, at least for a moment. I must have laid down, too, as I woke up on my back. When I opened my eyes, I didn't hear rain, but I did hear something else. There was a shuffling sound outside the tent, and I swear there were muffled whispers. The hair on my arm stood straight up. There was someone outside my tent. I looked next to me for my backpack, which I'd camped in my tent, but it was gone, and the zipper door was open. That was my fault. I'd fallen asleep with it open to keep an eye out on things. Whoever it was had crawled into my open tent door and dragged my backpack outside. I was immediately grateful that that's all they did. I stayed completely still, listening to whoever it was just shuffling through my things. The whispers sounded like they were wanting food, but the most I kept in my bag on these trips were cliff bars. I didn't know what to do in this situation. I didn't want some crazy stranger in my campsite. I didn't want someone digging through my things. Call me stupid. Call me crazy too. But for some reason, the idea I had was to remind them that someone was inside this tent. So, pretending to still be asleep, I audibly acted like I was changing positions. I cleared my throat and audibly turned onto my left shoulder. The moment I stopped moving, my guest went quiet. For the longest time, it stayed quiet, just like that. I didn't hear footsteps moving around at all. I didn't hear anyone travel away from my tent, and the rain didn't come back just yet. It was eerily, disturbingly quiet. I stayed like that for about 30 minutes straight, too scared to move, too scared to look, because if I hadn't heard it move, it had to still be out there, right? As quietly and slowly as I could, I lifted myself up so that I could face the tent wall again foolishly thinking that I could see something through the tent wall, but I couldn't. Then I turned toward the open tent flap. I screamed. There, just at the tent door, was a pale face with throbbing blue veins underneath, eyes completely bloodshot with no pupils, not a trace of hair anywhere, and an open mouth, sharp teeth just barely visible behind the lipless opening. When I screamed, the face pulled away back where I couldn't see it, and I heard rapid footsteps leaving my campsite. I sat there for a few seconds, wondering, had that thing been staring at me the entire half hour I lay there pretending to sleep? I didn't even know what it was. It had the face of a person, but everything else was all wrong. A person's skin shouldn't be that color unless they were dead, and last I checked, people have pupils in their eyes. I packed up all my things as fast as I could, and I trekked through the night through the woods. I heard footsteps the entire time, cautious and distant, just like the first time. I knew it was the same thing, the thing I'd saw. Those footsteps belonged to the thing with that face. I was sure of it, imagining seeing that thing up close, horrified me enough to put a scared spring in my step. Now, I didn't make it back to my truck the same night. It would take another day. But I did stumble upon some other campers who had four-wheelers. They offered to let me stay the night with them. I must have looked disheveled and worn out by then. And I know they were strangers, but they were friendly, and they had normal-looking faces, unlike that thing I saw. So I took them up on the offer, I even told them my terrifying weird story over dinner, and they believed me. 
It was two guys, both brothers, and one of their wives, out on a little camping hunting trip. They told me they'd been hearing and seeing strange things in the woods themselves, and apparently for them, it hadn't been the first time. They'd seen pale, nude figures in the woods that looked almost human before. They told me that when they told their friends, who don't go hunting and camping like they do, the friends would laugh, disbelieve them, and assume they were just trying to scare them. It was extremely relieving, having someone to talk to and to believe me, having people to spend my final night in the woods with. Plus, nothing else scary happened. In the morning, one of the dudes gave me a ride to my truck. He gave me his phone number to keep in touch, which we did, but unfortunately, I denied his requests to go camping in the future. Because after this, I was done camping, and I'm still done camping for a long time. Wendigo Encounter From Anonymous I was born and raised in Wisconsin. We live in a small town where everyone knows everyone. I am the only child in my family until I turned 12, when my parents decided to adopt a child. They told me that I'm going to have a little brother to play with. I was happy, of course, to finally have a little brother, and I couldn't wait to see him. Then the time came, November 28th that year. When my parents came home from the adoption home with my little brother, I was so happy. Seeing him coming out of the car smiling at me, I smiled back and I ran to him, hugging him and saying, Welcome home. His name was Ethan. He was seven years old and he was from Kenosha, Wisconsin. He's a sweet kid, quiet at first, but he's very helpful with me and my parents around the house, helping with the cooking, cleaning, etc. His parents passed away during a traffic accident with him inside the car, but he survived. What happened to him was very sad. Now, my dad loved hunting. Dad always tells us everything about hunting. Know your surroundings, know what you're packing. Keep track of where you are and especially pull up the ladder when we go to our treehouse in the woods. And most importantly, remember that there will be other people out there hunting as well. Our dad is a gentle person. He always helps us with everything like school, homework, and all that. He plays games with us and does everything with us, including hunting, fishing, and hiking. Eight years later, our dad passed away. He was killed in an altercation with a robbery in progress. He was shot. We were all devastated about what happened to Dad. He'll always be with us in our heart, and will always be our hero. One day I took my little brother Ethan to go hunting with me. We went to the forest that Dad always takes us to. We have a little treehouse in the woods out there, where we sat, hunting for deer, squirrels, and other animals. But at the time it was deer season. When we got there, we climbed the ladder up to our treehouse. We always remembered what Dad told us about pulling up the ladder when we get to the top of the treehouse, just in case some stranger or creep tries to climb up to us. So Ethan and I just sat there and waited. We talked, snacked, laughed, and played board games, waiting to see if any deer came by. We had seen a lot of hunters walking by, and we greeted each other with a hello or good morning. We waited and waited and saw no deer cross our path whatsoever. Ethan wanted to go use the restroom, but I told him to just go over the side. He said he needed to go number two, so I told him, Fine, you can go, but I'm staying here, just in case a deer comes by. Remember what Dad told us, about taking the radio just in case you get lost? Ethan dropped the ladder and climbed down, and went back to the ranger's outpost cabin that was about two miles back, and the trail was easy to remember, so Ethan should be just fine. I was looking around, still keeping an eye out for deer. By 6pm, close to 7, Ethan hadn't come back yet, and it was getting dark. It had been at least an hour or so since he'd left. He had a radio, but I heard no contact from him. I was worried, and I didn't want to just leave him out there. So I radioed him, but there was no answer making me worry even more. All of a sudden in the dark forest, I heard noises, cracking in the woods. 
Luckily, I have a night vision scope on my rifle. I took a good glance around my surroundings but saw nothing. I was confused, but I kept on looking just in case it was deer. After all, I was so eager to get one. Moments later, I heard my little brother Ethan calling out my name. Lincoln, come back! I was confused a bit, hearing my little brother scream my name while walking through the woods with no light. How could he see through the trails of the forest like that? Lincoln, come back! Ethan kept saying the same thing over and over again. I thought to myself, that is not my little brother. He isn't so stupid he would be walking out in the forest without light. So, who was calling my name? Lincoln, come back. The voice came closer and closer, and soon, it seemed the voice was right under the tree where our treehouse was. Then I remembered that I hadn't pulled up the ladder when Ethan left to go use the restroom. Quickly, I pulled up the ladder as fast as I could. Lincoln, come down. I knew that was not my brother. I fired some of my buckshots in the air to scare whatever that was down there under the treehouse. It screamed as if startled. A weird cracking sound came from it, a sound I'd never heard in my entire life until then. Then, whatever it was, ran back into the forest. I was left there, scared, shaking, and sweating. I waited until sunrise, hoping Ethan was okay. When the sun finally came up, I slowly climbed down my treehouse ladder, and I ran as fast as I could to the ranger station, telling them what I'd experienced last night. They didn't believe me, of course, thought that I'd had a bad dream. But I found my little brother Ethan, and I told him what happened. Apparently, he had been there all night with the rangers, because they wouldn't let him go outside at night, afraid that he would get hurt. I don't know who or what that was, out there in the woods talking to me, trying and succeeding to sound like Ethan but I'm happy that nothing happened to me during the encounter. If I didn't shoot that warning shot, if I didn't remember to pull up the ladder, I don't know what would have happened. Years passed, my brother and I never went hunting at that place again. Having read stories similar to mine, I believe it may have been a wendigo or something, imitating my little brother's voice to lure me into the woods. Wendigo, from Wild Taco. First off, I'd like to say I've never believed in Wendigo or Skinwalkers before this. After what happened that day, my mind may have been changed, and I will forever choose somewhere else to go camping. I'm a big off-roader camper. I love finding new trails that are challenging or nearly impossible to get up in a stock 4x4. This story starts in late June of 2020, in Canada, British Columbia, Radium. My dad and I had been planning on doing an off-road day trip in my mod 2013 Tacoma, just outside of Radium. We ended up finding a gravel road, which went steeply up the side of a mountain, and took you in this other valley with glaciers all around. Let me tell you, up there, it was an amazing view. After finding the place, my dad wouldn't stop saying that after all the years he'd lived in Radium, he had never been on this trail. We kept following the trail as it got narrow, to the point you could only just fit one truck on the trail. Soon we came across a nice little cabin, complete with a small barn and outhouse. The place was falling apart, and we found a lot of stuff like boots and empty food cans, etc., we explored the area for a bit, then kept driving. The trail began to come out of the trees, and we started to follow a cliff with a big drop on one side, as well as a small creek, steadily growing from melting snow. We stopped by some deeper snow. My dad and I got out and began to hike. We wanted to see what the trail was like up ahead. I was thinking it was a better idea to come back later when the snow was melted, 
but I kept hiking with my dad about a kilometer in. My dad then stopped for a moment, but I went on ahead. I found this area that seemed protected from the wind, and I went back telling my dad that it would be a nice camping spot. He laughed, then said to me, You think you could get your truck up these big and loose rocks? I answered, confidently, Oh, I could definitely get it up here. He laughed again and said, Okay then. Now let me mention here, I hadn't yet felt anything strange, and we didn't see anything weird. Fast forward to late August of 2020. My girlfriend, her dog, and I went on a camping trip. We started our first day right on top of a glacier. That night, the temperature dropped to negative one, and that was measured in our tent, which my girlfriend was not happy about. Thankfully, the following day was nice, hot, and sunny. So we headed out to the next locale, which was the place that I went to with my dad. I was hoping that, this time, the snow would be melted off the trail. We got to the spot with the cabin, so I showed her around. She enjoyed looking around. We got back in the truck and kept going up the trail. We got to the part where there was a ton of loose rocks. I got out and moved some rocks around. Then we kept going. We had to stop a few times to let my truck cool down, as I was having problems with my radiator. As we got higher in elevation, my girlfriend suddenly said something weird. She said that this is where Wendigo might be. She believed in stuff like that, and she usually doesn't like talking about it. But for some reason she brought it up here, and the more she kept going with it, the more I got upset. Maybe it was even making me paranoid. We were trying to enjoy ourselves out here, not stress ourselves out or get scared. Eventually, we got to the spot where I was going to set up camp. We got out, and I told her that I was going to fly my drone to see what the area looked like. I was flying it around when I spotted an old mine. I flew my drone back and switched out the battery. I told her I was going to take a walk. She went back to the truck to wait for me, but as she opened the door, her dog got out and decided to join me on my walk. Her dog had a fondness for me and enjoyed being my walking buddy sometimes. As we walked, I continued to fly my drone and look around with it. I was starting to get this weird feeling, a sensation that something was wrong, that I should not be out here. I looked at my phone and it was 9 p.m. The sun was starting to go down. I quickly went back to the truck and I asked my girlfriend if she had a weird feeling too. She said yes. We agreed it was time to leave. We were back in the truck and four low, basically crawling down the mountain. My girlfriend kept looking behind us while I was focused on the road, trying to get us down as fast as I could safely. That feeling of dread continued to grow within me. I felt as if there was something up here, something wrong. By then it was completely dark and I was taking the truck down this one-way road, kicking through gears and doing 70. When we were well away from that area, I looked over at my girlfriend, but she seemed traumatized. She had this disturbed look about her, eyes wide and unblinking. Scared from just looking at her like that, I asked her what she'd seen. Apparently, she was looking behind the vehicle because she saw something following us. She looked at me, voice trembling, describing that she had seen a very tall, skinny, dark figure with long arms that, whatever it was, stood about eight feet tall. A month after this, my dad was talking to some of the people that live in Radium. He was told that we should never go back there again, that folks had been working on closing that trail down. In fact, the name of that area by the mountain is called Wendigo Valley. It's said that the people who lived in that cabin nearby got chased out of there back in 1940 by something that looked similar to what my girlfriend saw. Supposedly, there have been other people going up there who got chased out. One person even got a dent in the hood of their truck from that strange creature. Well, we took that warning to heart, and we will not be going back.
Warning. The following story contains depictions of violence against pets and other animals. Something in my barn. From Vanderbeek. Seven months ago, my grandfather on my mom's side passed away. During this time, I was a senior in college and very close to graduating. Needing a place to stay and not wanting to share a house with my overbearing mother, I was able to convince my mother to sell me my grandfather's land. This was a beautiful property, about 230 acres of land and half of it was woodlocked. The rest was field and farmland though. Most of it was used to house animals that had long since been sold as my grandfather's age caught up with them. As a kid, I loved the land, exploring the forest or attending to the animals. Revisiting the property shot memories of my grandpa back to the forefront of my mind. Getting the property back in working order was a difficult process, but after a couple of weeks, the old farm had become my home. Perhaps one of my favorite activities was going out on the porch at night to gaze at the stars that I could never see in the city. But the first incident happened not a week after I got the garage cleaned up. I was out on the porch watching the sunset, smoking a cigarette, when from the distant woods, I hear this ear-piercing screech. Now at this point, I'd lived there for four months, and I had familiarized myself with the sounds of the forest. So no, this wasn't an elk or a coyote or even a mountain lion. It was different. This screech sounded more like the combination of a moose in heat and a woman being killed. This wasn't too far out either. Normally the sounds I hear are distant and faint, but this sounded like it was just a few kilometers away. After that, I didn't feel comfortable with staying outside. The darkness of the woods no longer felt comforting, and every noise I heard put me on edge. I swore at that point I was being watched. After about a week, I got over it. I even asked my neighbors about it, but none of them had ever heard of an animal that could produce that sort of sound, at least none that live in this area. The second incident was just last month. I woke up in the middle of the night and I needed to get a glass of water. I leaned over the counter, which gave me a good view out the window that led to my front yard and driveway. As I drank a glass of water, I noticed movement in the brush outside. I honed in on where I thought I saw the movement, and not five seconds later, I saw something run from the brush to behind my shed. Assuming it was a coyote, I grabbed the rifle I had in the broom closet next to my front door, and I headed out to the porch in nothing but my house coat and slippers. The first thing I was greeted by was an offensive smell that physically burned my sinuses. It smelled like rot. Not just rot though, but also like the taste of blood, if that makes sense. I grabbed the high-powered flashlight next to my rocking chair, and I lit up my front yard. Not wanting to get dressed and go looking for a stray coyote, I instead turned the flashlight off, and I sat down on the porch. I waited to see if it would pass by again. After a while, I quickly got bored, and I took out my phone to check Facebook and otherwise just mess around. A few minutes after I took out my phone, I noticed some movement out of the corner of my eyes. From just behind my shed, which was maybe 60 yards away, I saw a small singular antler poking out from around the corner. Now it wasn't unusual to see deer on my property, but what was weird was the size of it. From where I was standing, this deer would have to be over nine feet tall. So this was a massive deer, especially considering the size of its rack, which was only less than 15 inches. I stood for a moment confused by the size until I thought about the thing that had originally brought me out here. I know that deer couldn't be what I saw because the thing I'd seen was far too close to the ground. A moment after pondering this, I saw the deer, or at least the antler, fall to the ground, and after that, I heard something scurrying across the ground. I turned on the flashlight, and I shined it across the brush. Out from the brush came the most unnatural thing I'd ever seen. 
On all fours, the thing stood, eyes glowing like flame. At first, I thought it was a starving man. Its skin was so pale. Each hand had five fingers, and its figure was deathly slim. But the thought of this being a man was quickly dismissed when I saw the massive claws and sharpened teeth and the antlers adorning its head. Acting out of pure fear and adrenaline, I shot at the thing, but I must have missed it, as the creature was now crawling towards me at an alarming speed. I dropped my gun and my flashlight and practically threw myself through the front door before slamming it behind me and locking the deadbolt. My dog came running to the door to see what the commotion was. I pulled him away from the door, but froze when I heard the doorknob moving. I turned to see the doorknob slowly turning, and when it reached its apex, the door was suddenly jerked forward violently, luckily being caught by the deadbolt. My dog began to bark uncontrollably, the door continuously being smashed into by that thing outside. I was trying desperately to pull my dog away from the door. He's an Anatolian shepherd and weighed more than 100 pounds, so this task was a difficult one. It wasn't until we heard the ungodly screaming from behind the door that my dog backed off with his tail between his legs. That was a disturbing sight, to see my dog, a dog that big, afraid. I've seen him try to chase Moose off of the property, and yet whatever was behind the door had him more afraid than an 800-pound moose. I can't say I blame him. I stayed in my room with my dog for the rest of the night, and only after daybreak did the overwhelming smell of rot finally leave my sinuses. That brings us to the third and final incident. I had told my family about the creature, but none of them believed me. I even called the cops and got fined for wasting their time. I knew it was still here because of the smell that came each night. One morning, I even woke up to find the body of a doe, its stomach split open on my porch. Some nights I can see it, crawling out of the barn to torment me. But this particular night, it crossed a line. I woke up to find the smell was worse than ever, but the worst part was the scraping on my window. I grabbed my gun that I now kept next to my bed, and I slowly approached the window. I couldn't see much as it was an extremely foggy night, but I did see those glowing ember eyes and a pale hand trying to open the window. I took aim and fired at the thing, aiming between its eyes. I heard a scream that was so loud it made me drop my rifle again, and I covered my ears. Then, I heard something tumble off my roof and hit the ground. I thought this was my chance, so I grabbed my rifle and my dog and gave chase. But I saw that thing somehow crawling away. My dog practically ripped the leash from my hand to pursue it. I'd run for maybe 30 seconds before I lost track of my dog in the fog. I scoped in my rifle and looked around before approaching my decrepit barn that I didn't have the time nor resources to repair. I saw my dog run inside. As I approached, gun raised, I heard a growl, a thump, some shuffling, a scream, and finally a crack before the darkness of the barn fell silent. I stared ahead, trying to find my dog, but not a moment later, my vision was invaded with white and red. I'd been pinned to the ground, rifle knocked out of my hand, eyes shut tight, awaiting my demise. But what I felt next wasn't pain, it was fur. There was warm liquid running down my hand. I opened my eyes and saw that I'd been pinned by my dog. Relieved, I sighed before noticing the red stains over his fur and distinct lack of breathing. I was in shock, staring at my dog tears forming in my eyes, but my shock didn't last as I saw the thing approaching. It was at its full height, walking on two legs now as it slowly approached me. Quickly, I scrambled to my feet and ran towards the house. I'm not sure if the thing chased me, but I wasn't going to look and find out. 
I spent some time in a motel after that. I've spent a lot of time away from my home, my grandpa's home. I don't want to abandon my property, and I also want that thing to pay. It killed my dog, tossed its body at me like a rag doll. After researching this thing, it sounds an awful lot like the thing they call a Wendigo. At this point, I don't know what to do. Shooting it right between the eyes seemingly had no effect. I locked eyes with a Wendigo. Did it curse me? From Inky the Raven. I've always been an open-minded person who has believed in the supernatural and in cryptids. But this encounter made me 100% positive that there are things that live in this world that we don't understand. It happened in fall of 2010. I was 16 years old back then, living with my dad in our home in the countryside of southeastern Ohio. Our property's backyard, which was a field, actually bordered the largest state park in the state of Ohio, something I think played into this occurrence. It was around 8 p.m. when the sun had just fully set, allowing for the bright fall moon to bathe the ground in its soft glow. I was sitting down watching some crappy movie. I think it was Summer Catch or something. It was then that I felt the oddest sensation... I had this urge to approach our large glass front door, almost like I was being beckoned or called. Upon reaching the door, I looked out at the bright moonlit front yard to see a tall, milky white skinned creature on all fours running. Then it stopped, like a predator sensing its prey. Its skin was pulled tightly against its emaciated, almost skeletal body, which was almost glowing in the moonlight. It smelled the air like a hungry wolf smelling for a rabbit before its head snapped to the right towards our front door. It locked eyes with me. Its eyes were a milky white, devoid of retina or pupil. And I also realized its lips and nose were absent too, gone from its pale, bald head. It felt like an hour that my pale blue eyes and its milky orbs looked into each other's souls, or whatever this thing possessed inside that might resemble a soul. After this stare down, it snapped its head back forward and sprinted off towards the field of our property. After it left my sight, I immediately backed up slowly, utterly shaken. Upon reaching the living room, my dad asked why the weird entrance. I told him what I saw in a trembling voice, which unsurprisingly, he shot down and disbelieved my story. He said I was making it up, or that I'd just seen a coyote. I argued with him that what I saw was no creature I'd ever seen before, and that coyotes aren't hairless, pale, and white. He just rolled his eyes and said to calm down, that it was nothing, that I needed to just let it go. Later, I thought it over. I was thinking maybe he grew up on the same property, so he'd seen it too, and he just didn't want to remember it. That night, I slept with my hockey stick in my bed next to me. Or at least, I tried to sleep. Alas, sleep eluded me, and I spent the next day nodding off in class, trying to shake the weird feeling that locking eyes with that thing had brought me. I began to slowly relax and pushed it to the back of my mind, only being reminded when the sun went down daily. Now, I had to let my dachshund puppy out every night, but every so often I'd look out at the dark woods of the state park in our backyard, and I swear I felt like it was staring back at me still, as if it was waiting for its chance to come closer than before, to make me sorry I ever looked it in the eyes. After graduating high school, I moved in with my mom in the city. Due to a mixture of her and I being close, and her having health issues, I wanted to help take care of her, and partly because of my father and I's strained relationship. However, I knew deep down it was also due to the fact that I could never see that thing again in the city. And well, it did work. I never did see it in the city. But one cold weekend in the winter of 2013, my best friend's mom began to date my dad, 
so I decided to go visit, spending the weekend at my dad's house. My dad and his girlfriend were Christmas shopping, so it was just my best friend and I at home, alone with the dogs. Of course, at a certain point, we needed to let them out to pee, so we opened the sliding back door to let them out, but immediately we were hit with a deafening silence from outside. It was like all of nature and the nearby highway had been muted. Right away, I felt that feeling of eyes on me from the woods, and I was brought back to that night years earlier. I quickly told my friend to shut the door, that I didn't care if the dog just peed inside this time, though it would get me a tongue lashing from my dad, but so be it. I had to do something to escape this thing's sight, to get away from it. I didn't want it getting closer to me. I didn't want it smelling me. Now comes the part that has, as of the last few months, bothered me. It made me feel as if that night in 2010 left me cursed. Over the years after that event, I've been in two car accidents. I've also nearly died of appendicitis. I've had the worst string of bad luck. I went through a period of time where I nearly killed myself from depression, along with other straight-up horrible instances where I've just felt cursed. Even recently, I've been diagnosed with fibromyalgia, which is a painful and life-hindering nerve and muscle disease that has forced me to have to go on disability along with my worsening anxiety issues. I came to the conclusion that I was cursed and realized that what I saw may have been a wendigo. The idea came to me this past spring when I watched a show called In Search of Monsters, which had an episode on the wendigo. It was described to not only have the traditional accounts of being tall with a deer's skull, but as a tall, pale humanoid with no nose or lips, paired with milky white eyes. This, of course, caused me to have a full-blown panic attack. I actually shook as I realized I had locked eyes with this voracious and terrifying beast. This led me to begin to read about and study the Wendigo. My research has both led me to feel terrible for the poor souls that must suffer the fate of being one, but also to be in a fear-induced awe of their ferocity and power. I believe when I locked eyes with that Wendigo over 11 years ago, it didn't do its often reported possession, which might have made me into the next Wendigo. No, instead it cursed me to have all the misfortunes, personal pain, and discord in my life. The Wendigo, from Anonymous. I live in a small Vermont town. I was 12 at the time. Though it's been over a decade, I remember this like it happened yesterday. It was early spring, and we had just withstood an exceptionally harsh winter. I was a troubled kid who ran away often. In the middle of the night one night, at 3 a.m., I was on my way out the door. I turned around and up the hill standing in the road under the street lamp was what I thought at first was a severely deformed deer. I quickly realized it wasn't when it stood on two legs and began to sniff the air. From my estimate, it must have been a little over seven feet tall. Its antlers were growing out of what seemed to be a human head with a protruding jaw. It was so oddly proportioned. Its ribs were exposed, it had lengthy claws and hooved feet. It turned its head towards me and began running on all fours. I had never seen anything run that fast in my life. As it got closer, I could make out better details of its face. Its lips were gone or non-existent. Its skin looked frostbitten, and its eyes were black. I ran inside, shutting the storm door. The closer it got, the more it drooled, too. I shut the front door then, and suddenly, I heard something hit the storm door. Then, something unexpected and terrifying happened. A distorted voice came from the porch. That thing out there. It was mimicking a woman's voice. It was saying, Let me in. I screamed and ran to my mother's room. I startled her awake. Together, the two of us went back to the door to investigate. There was no one outside. 
but the proof remained. That monster had hit the storm door so hard it was severely dented. I couldn't speak for over an hour. I was so scared. But once I was able to, I couldn't bring myself to tell her what I'd really seen. She still believes the creature responsible was a mother black bear who was defending her cubs. But my story doesn't end there. I overheard my burly neighbor quietly ranting at a man about a creature who had chased him to his car. I asked him about it, but he lied to me. I told him about what I'd seen, and he and his friend were now dumbfounded. They asked me if they could see the door, and I obliged. They drove past my house, and the man turned to my neighbor and nodded. The following day, at dusk, five men pulled up in a truck. I went over and talked to the man who had been conversing with my neighbor the day before. What are you doing? I asked him. Mm, hunting, he replied. You're gonna go kill that thing, aren't you? Yeah. Well, what is it? I continued to question. Kid, you should go back to your house, he said sternly. Not until you tell me. <sighs> you ever heard the story of the Wendigo? Now go back home, he hissed. They walked into the woods across from my house. Later that night, only two men walked out. I walked out onto my porch, and I began to ask where the man I'd talked to was but they shouted at me to go back inside. They got back in the truck and sped away. The next morning, I entered the dining room and saw a paper sitting on the table. The three men who didn't come back were on the front page. It said they were killed in a car accident, but I didn't think that was the truth. Needless to say, I don't go out after dark anymore. The Beast of Red Lake Reservation From Dredo 49 I'm a 23-year-old Chippewa Native American from the Red Lake Indian Reservation in Minnesota. My people don't usually speak of this. They believe that if you speak of it, or even say its name, it will hear you, and it will only be drawn closer to you. But I'm willing to take my chances and tell you the first time I saw the Wendigo. I was about 14 years old at the time. I was told about the story of the hunter that got lost in a terrible blizzard and was forced to partake in human flesh. The spirit of the Wendigo was born, looking for its next victim to possess. I was young and dumb, so I didn't really believe the story. Not too long after, I went out with my friends. Let's call them Ben and Kevin. We just sat outside for an hour and we had nothing to do. We decided to go to the place where we can go look for some cool looking stones. Nobody ever goes swimming in this part of the lake either. We got ready to head out. We were going to bring our bikes, but ended up just walking. It was only a half mile away after all. My friends brought their dog along too. His name was Poppy. As we began to walk, my friend asked, Hey Kevin, did you bring a cigarette? Which he did. But he only had one, so we had to do three drags and pass. As we finished our cigarette, we were almost there. But I felt off. It felt as if we weren't alone, and I wasn't sure why. I thought I was just paranoid. As we got there, we began skipping rocks for a while and hanging out. We even found a few arrowheads that were still intact. Ben and Kevin began arguing about something. I didn't really hear what they were arguing about, Probably not important. Fast forward about an hour later. By then, it was about sunset, so we decided to head back home. As we get to the fork in the road, we all hear this loud, blood-curdling scream. It sounded like a man and an elk screaming in unison. As the scream continued, we saw this big buck run by, followed by something. Whatever it was, it was about nine feet tall extremely pale. It stopped to look at us, too. It let out that same scream we had just heard. That was our cue to get out of there. We get back to my house and tell my parents about what happened. They didn't believe us. However, when my grandmother heard about our tale, 
she called us to talk. She said, I believe you saw the beast that roams these woods, a demon we call the Wendigo. You were lucky enough to be alive and tell the tale. From that day on, I keep my guard up. I think that deer saved us from it, remaining its target, its prey, instead of having its attention focused on us. If that deer wasn't there, at least one of us might not be here. Wendigo on my farm From Anonymous I was 30 when this encounter happened. I live on a farm in western Wyoming. I grew up in this home with my parents and my two older sisters. When we became adults, my two sisters moved out and got married, but I stayed home with my parents, knowing that my father needed help around the farm. A few months later, my mother had died of cancer, and my father died of a heart attack. It came down to me and my sisters after attending their funerals, but I promised my dad if he passed away, I would take his responsibilities and care for the farm. Two years after their passing, I moved on, and that's when the encounters began to happen. I was up one morning doing the chores around the farm, feeding the cows, pigs, and chickens. While I was giving water to the cows, I caught a glimpse of a shadowy figure in the woods. I didn't know what it was. When I looked again, the figure was gone, but I shrugged it off, thinking my eyes were playing tricks on me. Later that day, it was getting late, and I was finishing up locking up the cows and pigs in the farm. But I then heard a tree branch snap in the distance. I thought it might have been a bear, since they are common here, and that branch sounded thick, and whatever broke it would need strength or weight to it. So I double-checked that the barn door was locked. When that was done, I locked up the chickens in the coop and went inside to eat something. The following day, after finishing breakfast, I went out only to find that the barn door had been slammed in. I ran inside, seeing that all the cows and pigs had been slaughtered and partially eaten. There were even four long claw marks on one of the cows. I assumed that in fact a grizzly bear had gotten in, but I don't understand why a bear would be hungry enough to kill and eat four cows and six pigs. It didn't stay in my head long since I cleaned up the carcasses, after all, I had a lot to worry about on the farm. I decided to keep the chickens in the basement, so as to keep whatever killed those animals away from the chickens. When that was done, I was thinking about what attacked them, and I remembered the figure I saw the previous day. Maybe these two things were the same animal. A few hours after going to bed that night, I was awakened to a sound at my window. At first, I tried to ignore it, but the sound continued two or three times over. Then, they stopped. Still, curious, I looked outside. I froze. What I saw outside my window was no ordinary animal. I thought it was a man at first, but the skin was almost rotten, and it looked like it had not eaten for years from the look of it. It also almost looked like it had chewed off its own gums. When I saw its feet, I only found deer hooves, its arms were long and thin, ending in claws. I could see its rib cage through its upper body, and the head, I swear, looked like a flat-out deer skull with antlers on top. But its mouth had human-like teeth. The moonlight made its eyes appear to be glowing. I was petrified. Suddenly, the creature looked up, and I almost screamed. It stared at me for a while, but then it walked away, after it disappeared into the woods, I ran back to my bed and hid under the covers until the sun came up. Come morning, I somehow had the courage to go after this thing for what it did. I felt as if it was either me and my farm, or that thing. I brought with me a loaded shotgun, as well as a flashlight. Then I made my way into the woods, where I saw it walk off. In the forest, every little sound made me feel paranoid. A while later, I heard something I hope I never hear again in those woods. Silence so quiet, I could hear my own heartbeat. Every natural sound had disappeared. But then, out of nowhere, 
I heard what sounded like a child crying. They sounded to be maybe five or six years old. Slowly, I made my way in the direction of the noise. But then the noise stopped. I heard something else that chilled me to the bone. My own mother, my mom who had long since passed, calling out for help. When I heard her voice, I cried. I wanted to make my way to her, but then I heard something behind me. This wasn't my mother. It had been the source of my mother's voice, but no, it was the very same creature imitating her voice. It stood on two legs towering over me. It was easily eight feet tall. I snapped out of it and began to shoot at it. I heard a screech of pain, like a demonic elk crying out, as I reloaded, the creature turned around, but before it ran away, it gave me one last look. It ran off then. I ran back to my house, locking myself in, thinking about what happened. By the time it was getting dark, I had no intention of going to sleep, afraid the beast would come back. I couldn't be sure if I had killed it, or if it decided to stop bothering me, but it never did come back thankfully. When I was able to afford it, I bought new cows and pigs, and I repaired the farm door. I even invested in stronger locks. I believe what I encountered was a wendigo. The only other people I've told this story to are my two sisters, who surprisingly believed me. They told me when they were teenagers, they saw this dark figure with eyes that seemed to glow. I pray that none of us have to ever see it again. My New Year's Sighting From This Is Carrie It was New Year's Eve in 2013. My parents and I pulled up to my grandfather's house in literally the middle of nowhere in Colorado. It was a few hours away from the beginning of 2014, but I groaned. We had driven three hours to get to the one place where I had nothing to do. Sure, I could play a mobile game or text my friends on my iPhone 5, but the signal was bad up here, and even sending a simple text took a while. I walked into the house and instantly went to the living room. It was my favorite place in that house, because usually nobody was in there and it had a TV that may be playing something interesting. I entered the room and was immediately disappointed. Because I wasn't alone, my uncle was sitting on one end of the couch. Plus, I hated my uncle. He never hurt me physically, but he found it entertaining to mess with my mental health. I suffered from anxiety, and his constant name-calling and slandering comments didn't help at all. You could easily say that I should have just ignored him, but I took everything he said personally. That was just the way I was. The worst part was the fact that my parents had no idea. When I tried to tell them in the past, my uncle talked to my parents after the fact, and it was all dismissed as playful banter. But for now, I was in the living room with my uncle. Determined not to let him get to me this time, I sat down at the other end of the couch and I watched the college football game that was on at the moment. I do remember that my uncle did make a few comments, but I shrugged them off. Eventually, I pulled out my phone and started texting. Texting your boyfriend? Asked my uncle smugly. You know I'm straight, I muttered back. You see, I have no problem with the gender that anyone identifies with. I have some amazing friends, a good number of which identify as many different genders, and I don't respect them any less than I would a straight person. My uncle, on the other hand, didn't respect people of other identifications. It just gave me another reason to hate him. Fine, are you texting your girlfriend then? He asked. Yeah, I replied proudly. I'd started dating a girl named Alicia a few months beforehand and our relationship lasted for a long time. In fact, we're still friends today. Really? He asked. I didn't think anyone would date your adopted fat self. I looked up at him. What do you mean by that? I asked. 
Oh, sorry, said my uncle with a smirk. I guess you don't know. Don't know what? I asked. That you're adopted, he replied. Very funny, I said, turning away. Oh, I'm not joking, he said. You're adopted, and I can prove it. He pulled out his phone and pulled up a picture of a document. It took me a second to recognize them as adoption papers that included my name and the unmistakable signatures of my parents at the bottom. I had watched my parents sign things with those signatures time after time and I could see that they were accurate. I suddenly felt sick. I'm, I'm going for a walk. I walked out of the room and put on my boots. 11 p.m., the clock by the door read. I'm not sure why I remember that detail, but I do. I got outside, and I just walked. I didn't care where I went, I just wanted to be alone. I wandered into the woods close to the house with my phone's flashlight as my only source of light. I didn't care, though. I was upset. Very upset. Everything I thought I knew was a lie. I fought back tears as I picked up my pace into the thicker woods. I finally just looked up and realized I was in trouble. I turned in every direction, but the house was not in sight. I turned to my phone's map to try to find where I was, but I had no connection out here. Panic overtook my sadness, and I ran to try to find a way out. After running for a few minutes, I discovered a small clearing with a singular tree in the middle of it. I came to the conclusion that I was going to climb that tree to get a better view. But just as I began to climb, I heard a tree branch snap in the distance, and I froze. I heard the faint crunching of leaves getting closer. It could be someone else. They could help me. I don't know why to this day, but before I'd even seen what was coming, my body jumped into fight or flight. My adrenaline pumped, and I quickly went into the tree line to watch from afar. I turned off my phone light, so my only light was the moon. I heard the crunches enter the clearing, and my curiosity took over me. I peeked out from behind the tree, and I saw the outline of something massive. But somehow I could tell it wasn't a normal animal. Just the way it was moving, it was walking on two legs, but its arms hung low. It looked about ten feet tall, and the only word that I can describe it with is unnatural. Suddenly, it screeched a horrible, horrible sound. Then it left the clearing. I was horrified. I ran as far away from the clearing as I could, and somehow, I found my way back to the house. My mom soon saw me and ran to me. She told me she was incredibly worried. Unable to tell her about what I saw, I looked up and asked about what my uncle told me. That was the night I found out I truly was adopted. My parents and my grandfather were furious with my uncle, and after that night, they cut off all contact with them. New Year's proceeded as normal. I had just arrived in time for the countdown, and everyone gathered in the living room to watch it. Slowly, as people got tired, they trickled out of the living room until it was just me and my grandpa. I couldn't sleep, and I knew I wouldn't that night. My grandfather suddenly turned to me. What'd you see out there? He asked. You wouldn't believe me. I replied. Try me. He said, scooting closer to me. I told him truthfully what I saw. And instead of laughing, which I thought he would do, he was totally serious with me. I've seen it too. He told me few times, in fact, and I think it lives around here. Promise me you'll never go into those woods alone. 
I nodded my head to say yes. My grandfather stayed up with me that night, and even though he wasn't my true grandfather, we really grew closer. I loved that man, but he sadly passed away in 2018. I've been back to that house a few times since, but I've never seen the thing again. After my grandfather passed, someone bought the house I hope they stay safe because they may not know what they're getting into. Nothing really changed between me and my parents, and I still love them extraordinarily, but the terror I felt that night will affect me forever. Wendigo in Indiana Forest from Flint the Dragon 1 It was January of 2019. My boyfriend asked me to reshoot a scene of a short horror film that we had worked on for his film class. I agreed to, because the scene we were reshooting was set in the forest about an hour away, so no problem. Then again, the past few times we'd been filming there, it was full of arguing, but we were able to hold together to make a bad short film but I still enjoyed being in the woods for a change. The last time I'd gone camping at that point, I was seven, and I hadn't really been in a forest since then. I have lived in Indiana my whole life, and I was fascinated by cryptids. I knew what we saw that day. I was the lead actor in the film, playing a man who was driven insane during a walk in the woods with his best friend. The title of the film would become Ironic, but I'll save it for last. There were three of us filming, our friend who was tasked with makeup and being the camera woman and with my boyfriend and I as the actors. The only prop we had was a paper deer skull mask, and as you can gather from the prop, the film involved a wendigo. As I said before, I enjoyed the last few visits to that forest, but this time, I felt uneasy. That entire shooting session, I felt as if something was watching us, but I didn't know what it was. Later on, I began to see movement through the forest. I couldn't make it out. I told my boyfriend about it, and he jokingly said I was seeing Bigfoot. I ignored his joke, but I didn't rule out Bigfoot as being what I saw. I wish it had been Bigfoot, and I wish our camera had night mode. After finishing part of the scene, we noticed it had started to get dark, so we did our makeup quickly. My friend who was doing the makeup didn't have enough time to make it professional, but it still looked great. The bruises looked real and the fake blood had smeared great. When we got to the location for the final shot, the camera wasn't getting any light, so we opted for an audio ending to the film. As we packed up the camera, my boyfriend turned and looked into the surrounding trees, and he froze. I looked in the direction he was staring at, and our friend did the same. Through the trees, we saw a tall, lanky figure walking around. From what we could tell, it had pale white skin and long, claw-like fingers. I haven't told my boyfriend or friend about this, but I saw its face. It had sunken pits in place of its eyes. It didn't seem to have lips either, but I could see teeth. They were sharp, and it appeared to be drooling. The moonlight reflected off of something dripping from its mouth. My boyfriend said we should get out of there, and he gave me his pocket knife as we made our way back to the car carefully. As we neared the parking lot, I heard slow steps coming from behind us, like that thing was stalking us. We made it to the parking lot, and I heard it run deeper into the woods. I was the last to get into the car, and as I opened the door, I heard this blood-curdling shriek from the forest. It had an unnatural tone to it. I quickly got into the car, and we drove away. We didn't talk about it during the drive. My boyfriend was visibly shaken. We dropped our friend off at her house and my boyfriend dropped me off at mine, then went home. 
I told my mom about what we saw, and she asked if I knew what it was. I said honestly, it looked like a wendigo, and not the deer skull faced kind. It looked like what the original legends described, like it had been human at one point. I wanted to go back to where we saw it, but I decided against that, knowing that I couldn't fight back if things took a turn for the worse, and I'm not a small guy, neither is my boyfriend. But if the legends are true, we wouldn't have been able to overpower it. I haven't been in the forest since. I still have the mask. I kept it as a reminder of my encounter with that Wendigo. And as for the title of the short film we'd made, I'd given it the title of the first day of filming, not knowing we would even encounter that on the last day. It's titled, Wendigo Woods. I haven't seen the film, but I hope to see it at some point, just to see if we may have caught it on camera. I'll post an update on this when I watch the film and let you know if I see anything. The Wendigo That Followed Me Home from Austin C. This happened back in December 2020 in the Great Lakes region of western New York State. It was a snowy night when this event happened. I had just gotten off work, and it was getting dark out already. There was a decent amount of snow on the ground, while it was still coming down pretty heavily. So I thought it'd be fun to take my snowmobile out for a ride, since I didn't have anything else going on. Little did I know that would be a mistake. A mistake I would soon regret. For some background, I'm a 23-year-old guy and live alone in a pretty wooded area. There are a few farm fields surrounded by woods just down the road from me. I'm good friends with my neighbors who own that land, and they let me ride on it. I went outside and the snow was still coming down pretty heavily, but that didn't deter me, because I love the snow. I opened up the garage, uncovered my snowmobile, and fired it up, letting it warm up for a few minutes. I put on my riding gear and grabbed my high-powered LED spotlight for backup. Then I was on my way. As I pulled off the road and entered one of the fields, I spotted a herd of deer along the edge of the field. They took off back into the woods when I got too close for their comfort. I rode around for a few more minutes when out of nowhere I got this overwhelming urge to shine my spotlight into a patch of cedar trees. I was about 25 yards away from them. I turned off the snowmobile's engine and pulled my spotlight out of the riding bag behind me. I shined the super bright LED light into the trees. It took me a few seconds to see it. But peeking out from behind one of the cedar trees, I see what looked to be a buck with large antlers. At least, that's what I thought it was. Until I realized whatever this deer was had no eye shine like a normal deer. I could see the eyes on this deer were solid black and just empty. A normal deer would also not blatantly watch a person on a snowmobile from such a close distance. They'd run away like the herd of deer from before, but this one was staring daggers at me. Another feature that really stood out about this deer was it looked taller than a normal deer. Along with being very skinny and malnourished with missing patches of hair. At first, I didn't feel any fear, as I was in a state of complete disbelief and confusion as to whatever this abomination was in front of me. Then I remembered I've heard the Native American folklore stories about the Wendigo. I always thought stories about the Wendigo were just a boogeyman fairy tale to scare kids from going into the woods. This next part is the reason I still have nightmares about this creature. As I was still face to face with it, I very stupidly had the idea to yell out a question to it while trying to hold back the urge to laugh. Hey, are you a Wendigo? Obviously, I wasn't expecting a reply. But then, I kid you not, this creature replied to my question in a deep demonic voice. It said, yes. 
It then proceeded to laugh. That's when the immense fear and the urge to get out of there hit me like a freight train. I fired up the snowmobile, threw my spotlight in the riding bag behind me, and sped full throttle out of there. I almost wiped out a few times, getting back home from going so fast. I made it back in a few minutes, then scrambled into the garage. I parked the snowmobile and made sure every door and window was locked. I wish I could say this terrifying encounter ended here, but it didn't. Later that night after I'd gone to bed, I had a horrifying nightmare about that Wendigo. In it, I was being trapped in my house while this monstrosity was trying to break in to get me. It was speaking to me in that same voice. Austin, I can see you in there. I'm coming to get you. At that point, I woke up, startled in a cold sweat, and breathing heavily. I sat up in bed and looked around the dimly lit room. Peering in the window I hadn't shut the blinds to was that exact same monster that I'd seen on my snowmobile before, the one I'd seen in my nightmare, speaking those words that I thought were a dream. Except now, I was fully awake. But this time, while it was still staring daggers at me, it had a huge grin across its face, showing a row of razor-sharp teeth, and it was standing on two legs easily over seven feet tall. I could see even better now how much this monster looked like a rotting, decaying deer corpse. Needless to say, I screamed like a frightened child and started fearfully choking out the St. Michael the Archangel prayer, even though I'm not much of a religious person. As I was forcing myself to recite that prayer, the monster began emitting this otherworldly growl, and it laughed again. When I finished the prayer with the word Amen, the monster was just gone. I didn't sleep the rest of that night, and dreadfully waited for it to come back. But it didn't. I went and stayed with my family until I could move out of that house, and I never told anyone the story until now, out of fear of sounding insane. Even though I'm doing better now and living in a more populated area, I'll still have haunting nightmares once in a while about that terrifying monstrosity. I avoided becoming a meal for a Wendigo. From Death Raptor. This pandemic has been really hard for me, as I can't see my friends outside of online classes. I'm an extreme extrovert. It was around 7.30 to 7.45, and it was winter, so it was already dark then. That's when I had my encounter. I was relaxing outside in my aunt and uncle's hot tub. They have a cabin up on Mount Hood in Oregon, with about one road that passes by the grounds. There's tall, medium, and small evergreen pines scattered about the landscape, with white snow on the ground from a fresh afternoon snowfall earlier in the day. I was sitting in the warm water, occasionally whistling out into the dark, since I enjoyed listening to the echo it made. I was making whistling sounds like the way you call your creatures an ark. So yeah, every so often I whistled, all the while I laid in the tub. I'd eventually realized I heard nothing except the light drizzle on the roof from the cold mountain rain. No birds, no other animals, and no people, except for my family. I whistled once more, but weirdly enough, I heard what sounded like a reply a second or two after the whistle I emitted. I made the horror movie mistake of whistling again, and I got another reply. I was getting incredibly nervous. With newfound paranoia, I began to look around. My thoughts weren't fully on the darkness of the forest. I was thinking about teenage boy stuff mostly my girlfriend and overall missing her. The thing that really snapped me out of it was another whistle. I glanced around the forested expanse, and I noticed something that I didn't notice before. 
a set of yellow eyes staring at me from the woods several feet off the ground. It seemed so unreal, as the only other experience I'd ever had like this was when I saw what appeared to be a Sasquatch with my older brother back in 2013 in Gaston. The eyes disappeared, and I didn't see them again. I somehow had the courage to be outside for about 10 minutes after that, until the smart side of my brain said, dude, get back in the cabin. I realized I didn't hear it leave, whatever it was. I got out of the hot tub immediately and went back into the cabin, changing and coming into my room that I was staying in. That's actually when I typed this up. After looking through similar stories and researching on Wikipedia, I realized I may have just avoided becoming the meal of a Wendigo. I doubt it may have been one, but if it was, I would have just told it I was too sweet, and it probably wanted something saltier. But I think whatever it was decided I wasn't worth its time, and my family was inside and the cabin had large windows, so they would have seen it if it tried anything. But I really don't know what to think. When I told my aunt that I was uncomfortable being outside, she thought I meant I was uncomfortable being alone outside. So if you're out past dark in the Northern Cascade mountain range, stay sharp and bring a friend. Stay safe out there, folks. Was it a Wendigo? From Parrots247. I'm 14 years old and from Western North Carolina. This story takes place near Roan Mountain, Tennessee in December 2019. I believe I saw a Wendigo watching me. It all started late night a week before Christmas. I was sitting on my porch waiting for my mom to come stargazing with me. Yeah, I know it's weird, but it's something that my mother and I have always enjoyed doing. She was in her bedroom, which was adjacent to the porch, getting dressed. I was sitting on the porch waiting for her at around 10 o'clock at night. I heard some rustling by a large bush and looked over. There, I spotted two huge red eyes around four feet off the ground. I was staring at those eyes for what felt like forever. Then, all of a sudden, those eyes began to rise. I realized what they belonged to wasn't something small, it was huge. It walked out of the bush and seemed to be seven feet tall. I'm five foot ten and I had to look up to it from about 25 feet away. It had pale skin, large claws, matted black hair and patches, and it was staring at me. Then it let out a low growl and took three steps towards me. I'm not sure if it was a he or she, because it had no genitalia but it was built like a human man. I felt nothing but fear in that moment. For some unknown reason, it just turned away and walked in the opposite direction like nothing happened, and it was just going back home or something, or to the store or something else just as mundane. Then it walked behind my great uncle's barn, and it disappeared. The next day, I went to where it was, and there were footprints bigger than my hand, but they just stopped at the barn. I still sit out at the porch at night, but haven't seen anything like it since. I'd always heard of the Wendigo, coming from Cherokee descent, although I never thought I would see one for myself. If you're ever near Roan Mountain, Tennessee, be wary of what's in those woods, because you never know what you may see. Something Imitating Our Cows in the Fields From Anonymous I was at my grandfather's farm, which is on Native American land in Wisconsin. My dad had made jokes about the farm being an old Indian burial ground, which now I kind of believe. This supernatural thing I encountered that night heavily unsettled me as now I know that past experiences my dad and uncle had with supposed wendigos and skinwalkers might be true. Now, on to what happened. I had just finished up shuffling corn silage into our blower, heading up to my dad's old square body truck to drive over to mine to work on it. I drove over there and got the treble light out, 
plugged it in, and popped the hood on my truck. I just hung the treble light on my hood when I heard the cows bellowing. Now, I would have shaken this off as normal, but it was coming from the direction of our fields. I drove my dad's truck down to the barn to tell him. He then told me to go check the gates to see if the cows had ripped them down. But the gates were still up. I had the truck running with the lights on, and I shut it off. The same bellowing noises came from the fields, only now more distorted. Like it wasn't coming from cattle, it was coming from something trying to imitate the cows. It was too high pitch and almost sounded like it was crackling. I went ahead and drove my dad's truck back up to my truck. I put the light away and closed up the big steel shed my truck was next to. All the while, the sounds of those quote-unquote cows got more distorted, like some sort of unnatural animal both breathing and screaming very loudly. The bellows were happening in quick succession. This wasn't normal. Our cows never sounded like that. I was walking back to my dad's truck when I heard possibly the most unsettling sounds in about five seconds. From two different directions came two loud screams, not ear-piercing, but still plenty loud. Then, from the same direction that the cow sounds had come from, I heard coyotes howling. I bolted to the truck and hit the gas, not wanting to find out what could mimic cows and coyotes. I told my dad about it, and he asked what it was. I just told him I would tell him in the truck. Then he did what I didn't want him to do. He began to say, oh, skinwalker, a skinwalker. I yelled at him not to say its name. Eventually, we went back to the shed. Our farm yard isn't too big. From the shed where my truck is to the barn can't be more than 25 yards. But eventually, we went back up there with my grandpa's truck. Once there, my dad swapped the receiver hitch so we could hook it up to a kick bale wagon that my grandpa was going to bring back to our neighbors in the morning. I didn't want to be there much longer, so this didn't make anything at all better. Now, what makes everything about this story worse is that we have these stereotypical tall cornfields. It's good for business this year. They're probably 12 feet high in some places, but I hate the fact that something could be hiding in there so easily. I'm sorry if the writing was sloppy, but I'm really shaken up by this, and I'm probably not in the right headspace. If I encounter anything more regarding this, I'll let you know. Now, if you're still wondering about what my dad and uncle might have seen, I can tell you here. The story goes that it was the early 2000s. My dad and his older brother were out cutting firewood around late fall or early winter. It would get dark around that time, around 4.30 p.m. My uncle alerted my dad to something chasing deer across the field and on a hill. Whatever it was, it was gaining on the deer, and according to my dad, it looked half wolf and half ape. So yeah, that's that. Not sure if that would be a wendigo or a skinwalker. The worst part about all this is that the cows were up near our cow yard, which was near the fields, and to me it seemed like something was out there trying to communicate with them, trying to lure one or more away. Our cows aren't allowed out in our fields either, so this really scared me, and while writing this, I just heard breathing through my AC in my room. So, yeah, maybe I'll just go cry now. The Wenchuge and the Wendigo From Sea Spirit 81 I'm Native American. I've lived on a reservation my entire life. The res is surrounded by a thick blanket of pine trees, but after the first few meters, it thins out. Normally, the forest is bustling with hunters, trappers, and the occasional hiker but the elders of the res forbid anyone from staying in there past dark. Of course, no one actually enforces the rule. It's just like a superstition. There are a lot of superstitions around the res, but this is the most prominent. Around winter break of my senior year, me and my friends had snuck out to do what teens do, be way too loud and drink enough alcohol to clean out a full body paper cut. It was me and my two buddies, Let's call them J and B. Me, J, and B were hanging out by an old rusty pickup that had been there since before we were born. It had broken down on the edge of the res and had been there ever since. 
We were having a philosophical conversation about the passage of time, since our adolescence was almost over, and soon we would spout into responsibility. We had nearly polished off the bottle when, out of nowhere, a squad car of all things began to round the corner. Now, we were 18, which is one year away from legal drinking age in Canada, so naturally, we took off. We ran straight through the woods. I wasn't thinking about the warnings that had been drilled into me since childhood. I was thinking about what my dad would do to me if he found out what I was doing out here. While I tried to keep track of my surroundings and not throw up at the same time, I quickly lost track of B and J. I stopped in a clearing, grabbing my knees to catch my breath. In between gasps, I let out an audible, dang it. While my eyes adjusted to the newfound darkness, I tried to look around to see where I was. Suddenly, it hit me. Reality set back in. I was in the woods, in the dark, halfway to passing out, and based on my surroundings, I was lost. I'd run track in high school, and although I never got any medals, I was still pretty darn fast. But even in my intoxicated state, I knew that I should not have been able to run out of sight from the res. Just as that sobering reality set in, I heard something that made my nausea worse. From maybe 30 feet next to me, in the brush, I heard my own voice. But it wasn't exactly me, if that makes sense. It was more like I was talking through static. Something out there had repeated my words. Dang it, dang it. Just as it said that, the forest was met with complete silence. I stood there, shocked. I thought, or rather hoped, it was just one of my friends, but that thought was quickly extinguished when the thing repeated. Dang it, dang it. Exactly as it had before. I didn't think about running. I knew that if I did, this thing would chase me. At least, that's what I thought it would do. But what happened next was much worse. A large bunch began to shake violently, and all I could do was watch from my petrified state as the most disturbing thing I've ever seen in my life stepped out of the brush. It stood nearly nine feet tall. It was deathly thin and seemed to be rotting. Its body was covered in matted patches of fur, its legs bent backwards like a goat. When my eyes met its head, I nearly soiled myself. Its head was similar to a deer skull, but instead it held flaming yellow eyes and teeth sharpened to a point. As this monster slowly lumbered towards me, I tried desperately to run, but my body remained frozen. I never did understand how a person could be frozen in fear until that very moment. The thing was only a few feet away, my life flashing before my eyes, tears dropping from my face with each terrible slow step the beast took. Suddenly, a flash of white. The monster was no longer in front of me. It took me a second to even realize the thing was gone, but when I did, I looked over to see where it was. Now it was lying on the ground, and on top of it was what looked to be a pale man. At least I thought it was a man. What I saw had ungodly pale skin, thin ribs, and stretched limbs. The thing on top the creature's chest was clawing and kicking and screaming at it. God, that screaming. It echoed throughout the woods. It only took about four seconds of that screaming before my motor skills finally came back to me. My mind was screaming at me to run. It didn't matter where, just away from these two abominations in front of me. I ran for 20 minutes straight, without stopping, until I came to the highway that led to the reservation. And once I got there, I threw up on the pavement. It took another 10 minutes to walk to the res, and the entire time I was terrified that those things would come back. When I got home, I realized I'd lost my keys. So I banged on the door until my dad came to answer it. I must have smelled pretty bad because the first thing he did wasn't punish me. Instead, he looked concerned and asked what had happened. I was too tired, so I just passed out on the couch. When I woke up, I finally explained myself with a lie, telling him some bogus story about a bear. 
There is a bit of an epilogue to this story. A few days later, I asked around. I had questions that needed to be answered. I asked about who I should talk to for spiritual guidance. Everywhere I went, I was pointed to one lady, an elder in the center of town. I came to her and we spoke in her living room. I asked her about the things I saw, and this is what she said. She told me of the Wendigo and the Wechuge, two spirits similar in nature. The Wendigo is a spirit that can take over your body when you partake in the eating of your own kind. It will turn you into a ferocious creature that craves nothing more than raw flesh. A wendigo skin is said to be resilient. They can mimic voices almost perfectly, but they're ruthless and cunning. A wendigo will do anything to get its prey, except compromise its hidden nature. A wechuge is a spirit of vengeance. When a weak person becomes strong and uses his strength to pick on the weak, they will become susceptible to the wechuge. This will turn them into a deer-skulled, goat-legged creature, which lives to humiliate. They look to kill people in humiliating ways, like mocking them with their staticky voices or using their claws to mark their body. Wachuge have weak skin but heal quickly. They will always eat a portion of their victims as a sign of dominance, but their host can still be persuaded. Whereas when a wendigo takes over, it can control the victim in whole. But even if you can reason with a wechuge sometimes, they're not likely to listen. When the elder finished telling me this, I asked, Which do you think won? And she told me this, Both are fast, strong, and cunning, but the wendigo is more so. A wechuge's wrath is no match for the hunger of a wendigo. I don't think that's a deer. From C. Philly 100. My buddy and I were out hiking around the Estes Park, Rocky Mountain National Park area with his two daughters. It was very close to Twin Owls, if you know where that is. We were having a great time, even though the girls kept insisting to stop and draw on the dirt. It was a bit icy, so I had to put his youngest up on my shoulders at one point, and then I almost slipped which would have been catastrophic, but luckily I didn't, so we continued on our way. The sun was starting to go down, and we figured we'd better head back down to the trailhead. My head was on a swivel, looking for cougars, which are quite common in the area, and we did have two little girls with us after all. I noticed a pair of rather large antlers peeking out from behind a tree, and I had to do a double take, because these antlers were at least 15 feet off the ground much too high for any kind of deer or even elk. Almost as soon as I noticed them, it snapped its head in our direction, and I could see something was off about this creature. It didn't appear to have any eyes, just two solid black pits where the eyes should be, and the skin seemed to be peeling off around the empty eye sockets. Its lower jaw was hanging down, and it had teeth like those of a canid, long and sharp and somewhat yellowed. I nudged my friend, not wanting to alarm his daughters, nodding in the direction of that thing. He looked over too, then gasped. Then the girls screamed. Just then, it wrapped one of its arms. Yes, this thing had freaking arms around the tree it was standing next to, and it actually broke the tree in half before taking a jolting step forward revealing a leg that reminded me of a giant jackrabbit. It brought its hands around to the front, similar to a praying mantis, with long slender digits ending in short black claws. The other weird thing was it had brownish fur in patches, but its flesh was very droopy, even hanging off in sections. It had a rank odor too. I watched the creature swell up its chest before letting out the most god-awful scream I've ever heard. We grabbed the girls and began to run. I could see that thing in my peripheral, running alongside us, about 20 yards to our left. It looked to be almost galloping, and it was incredibly fast due to its massive size. We soon hit a snowfield and slid down, putting a bit of distance between us and that abomination. My friend's eldest daughter had twisted her ankle in the fall, 
and she was grimacing in pain. We started to hear then a low whistling sound, almost like when the wind passes over an empty glass bottle. The sound filled our ears and seemed to drown out everything else around us. Then there was a loud shriek, and that thing went flying over us, landing with a thud down in the clearing below before turning and rearing up to its full size. At that point, I'm not ashamed to say I think I might have just soiled myself, and we all screamed. It looked at us before slowly walking towards us, still holding its hands in that creepy praying mantis position. Even if I had a gun, I don't think it would have made a difference. This thing was easily a solid four or five hundred pounds or more, a true apex predator. It let out a low and guttural growl, and I felt paralyzed from fear. People talk about infrasound as a hunting technique utilized by large cats to subdue their prey, and honestly, it felt a lot like that. It walked right up to us, and I nearly puked just from the smell. The creature sniffed the air around us. None of us could move a muscle. We were caught like deer in the headlights, unable to move, unable to utter a sound, unable to even breathe. It reached out one of its long, bony fingers toward my friend's youngest daughter, and I swear I thought I heard the thing whisper, She is perfect. In that moment, something must have snapped in my friend, because he went into action swiping the thing's hand away from his daughter before grabbing onto its antlers and yanking them to the side, which didn't do much, but it did crack one of the antlers in half. I grabbed the girls, and we were able to slip around to the side, while it let out an evil hiss and swiped at my buddy, but he was quick and darted under its arm, stabbing it in the ribcage with the broken antler shard. I heard the thing scream, and we ran for our lives, because, well, our lives depended on it. This time, I had his eldest up on my shoulders. She was around eight or nine at the time, so not super heavy, and with my adrenaline pumping, it felt like nothing. I looked back and saw my buddy running behind us. He swooped up his youngest, and we made a mad dash for the vehicle, which was now thankfully in sight. We got to the car, putting the girls in the back, and hastily strapping his youngest into her car seat before jumping in and revving the engine. It took me a moment to realize we were still in park. I cranked it into gear and threw up a wave of dirt and pebbles peeling out of there. The girls were sobbing and, honestly, I felt like crying myself. We got down to Estes and called 911, but of course no one believed us. They thought it was just a prank call. Not wanting to get in trouble for calling the emergency line again, we drove all the way back down to Boulder before stopping to let the girls go to the bathroom. I'm still processing all of this, even though it happened over two years ago. But whatever that thing was, it wasn't a deer. Lack Wendigo, submitted by Ava C. This is a scary experience we had in Algonquin Park in Canada, where we got stuck on a road called Lack Wendigo. My family and I were camping up north for some time, but sadly, after six days, we had to leave. We left early in the morning around eight. I was with three people, my mother Cindy and my two cousins Cheryl and Samantha. As we were driving, my mother, being the outdoorsy type, wanted Cheryl to drive through her favorite place, Algonquin Provincial Park. It was simply gorgeous. I was eight the last time we went, so I hadn't remembered much and I was excited to go. I was too busy taking photos to realize Cheryl had turned down a road with the name Lack Wendigo. It was a very narrow, eerie road. We stopped a few times to have a snack and take some pictures. I've got to turn around, Cheryl said as she looked for a wide spot to turn. The only problem was there was nothing but a narrow path. She ended up having to unhook our trailer and back up until she could turn around. In the meantime, Black flies and deer flies swarmed all over our car. It got so bad that we had to roll the windows up. 
Even then, all you could hear was tapping on the glass from the flies ramming into it. Cheryl was finally able to turn her car around, but she had to back up to get the trailer. Both Cheryl and Samantha were panicking. Their faces were both suddenly filled with dread. Everyone got out of the car in a hurry. They were suddenly trying to get the trailer back on the vehicle as fast as they possibly could, and I couldn't understand what the hurry was about. But in no time, they had the thing hooked back up. Then I heard Cheryl curse under her breath as she got back in. They made a point to lock the doors and check that the windows were all the way up. Then we sped out of there, and I swear, we were going so fast, I thought we'd lose control at any second. The whole time this was happening, a feeling of being watched was coming over me, and just as we were taking off, that feeling was at its strongest, so I couldn't hold back anymore. I turned around in my seat and looked out the back window, and behind me stood something that I'd never forget. There was a tall, tall creature. It looked almost like a moose, but it was standing on its hind legs. It had these solid black eyes with an expression of anger on its face. It stared back at me with those beady black eyes, and I knew if we had stayed there any longer, we may have never left, at least not alive. I tried later to get an explanation from my family, but they never spoke a word. And ever since then, I've had nightmares about that thing. The Wendigo of Algonquin Park from Queen Bee. Location, Ontario, Canada. This is a story from my popa. A couple of years ago, he and I were talking about going hiking in Algonquin Provincial Park, somewhere that he had been multiple times and had grown up near. Unfortunately, his health was failing and our trip was canceled. He told me that it was likely for the best, since he wouldn't be able to protect me from the Wendigo if he saw it. My popa is half First Nations, with his mother being Cree and Huron, and his father being Scottish. Because his mother was removed from her home as a child and placed into the schools, she lost her status as First Nations and wasn't allowed to live on the res, but she lived just outside of it, near Algonquin Provincial Park. Popa has many friends who lived on the res and would often go with him into the park to hike and hunt when he was a young man. They saw many strange things in the deepest parts of the forest. However, this is the story he shared with me that day. Popa was hiking with a friend named Ben when they were in their late twenties. They had already been out in the park for several days, camping at nightfall and continuing in the morning. They were rather deep in the woods. It was late October and getting colder as the days went on, but they were prepared for that and often camped in the middle of winter. One night as the temperature dropped below freezing, they decided it was time to set up camp and start a fire. They were starting to gather wood when Popa heard something. It was the crying of a baby or a child. Popa had grown up during the Great Depression and had heard stories of people abandoning unwanted babies and children in the forest. He started to follow the crying when Ben grabbed his arm. Don't go over there, John. It's not what you think it is. Ben said, looking a little pale. We should move our camp, or that thing will just keep wailing and getting closer. Popa was confused, not understanding what his friend meant. But what if that's someone in need, a kid or another camper who got lost? He broke free from his friend's hand. I can't leave until I check it out. Ben sighed, but relented. He loaded his hunting rifle and told Popa to do the same before they went to check. The forest was in twilight now as they moved towards the crying. As they broke through a thick patch of trees, they came to an old campsite. There lying on the ground was a child that looked to be no older than a year. Popa started walking towards it, but Ben stopped him, telling him to wait. As Popa looked back, the child began to change. It stood up, 
the legs under it growing long and bent as if it had two sets of knees, each bending in a different direction. Its arms were much the same, with two elbows per arm, one bending forward, the other back. Its torso grew the size of a large man. Its ribs were protruding as if threatening to tear through the skin, and its head grew to the size of a man's, but with a mouth so large it took up most of its face. When its jaw unhinged, it began to cry again, as if it was trying to draw them closer to it. Ben began to chant, and the beast screamed as if in pain before running off, knowing that this was not going to be the easy meal it wanted. Popa was frozen to the spot. What was that, Ben? That, John, was a wendigo. The spirit of a person who became lost in the woods and starved. It is said that the spirit over time becomes twisted and evil. You must never approach one without protecting yourself first. Now let's go move the camp. This is its hunting grounds, and it will be back. Popa is in his late 80s now, and every time he tells this story, he still looks terrified. He's now a palliative, meaning his days are numbered, and he asked me to take his ashes to Algonquin Park, as he did with Ben's, and scatter them through the woods. But he reminded me never to go alone, lest I come face to face with the Wendigo. My Experience in Algonquin National Park by Ike. I was taking a school trip with about half of my grade through the forests of Algonquin National Park. It's a huge, huge provincial park where you're surrounded by water and trees and pretty much nothing else. The wildlife there flourished and everything is secluded from our present society. In other words, there's no signal on your cell phone for the most part no buildings, no nothing. We stayed there for a week with two guides and six other guys my age. The first day was great. We got to this camp that my school was hosting. I remember the lake water and trees and the beautiful cabins that we slept in for the night. Nothing too interesting happened that day. We got there and set up for the week. When we woke up, we headed down to the main lodge for breakfast and then set off for the water. On our second full day there, we were canoeing. I think we were doing it for about five or six hours. I didn't have a phone or watch with me, so I had to use the sun to guess. By the time we found a nice spot to sleep for the night, it was really dark. We set up our tents and got ready for dinner. On my way through the forest looking for twigs and branches for kindling, I spotted the most curious looking animal. It stood like a person but had the hide of a deer, and the head of it was like a wolf and deer mixed together. The moment I saw it, my body kicked into some primal fear mode. I stayed absolutely still, and my breathing went so quiet that I couldn't even feel or hear it. I was alone in the woods with this thing, my camp a few minutes away. I heard a snap of a twig, making me nearly jump, my head darted in that direction, and when I didn't see anything, I quickly turned back to this abomination before me, but it was gone. Quickly, I took the opportunity to run back. I was twigless when I came back, and my guides asked why I hadn't gathered anything. I quietly told them that I uh, couldn't really find much good kindling, and that I wanted to help them start the fire instead. They looked at me funny, but consented. About two days later, we were canoeing again. We did a portage and then canoed and portaged again, repeating the process, until we came upon a mother moose and her baby drinking in the water. They were beautiful but intimidating. All of a sudden, I was overwhelmed with this feeling of terror. I was worried. I began to scan the forest around us, and I spotted the thing I'd seen before just two nights ago. 
I didn't know what it was, but just having it around me, it made me feel like my world was coming crashing down. My group started to shout at the moose to get them to move. We were in the water, so we should have been safe from any moose attacks. And luckily, the mother moose and baby got the idea. They turned and disappeared into the forest. By the time we reached the shore, the creature had disappeared as well. Though I was left horrified at the idea of being in the woods again with that thing. That night, we were roasting marshmallows, the stereotypical camping trip snack. My throat got dry all of a sudden, so I went over to my tent to get some water. And a few minutes later, we went to bed. About three hours after that, I woke up, quickly regretting all the water I had drank. It must have been about one in the morning if I had to guess. I found myself a nice little spot to relieve myself. I didn't bring a flashlight, but it was okay because the moon was shining brightly in the sky. That was when, once again, the dreadful feeling came over me as goosebumps sprouted all over my skin. Something about the dark had always freaked me out, but this was different. This was like my body knowing it wasn't alone anymore. It knew I was in danger. I felt this sudden urge to turn around, and soon I did. I saw the creature again, standing on two legs. It was closer than ever before, really giving me an idea of how big it was. Its eyes reflected yellow in the moonlight, and it was bony below its neck. And to be real with you, it looked like it had passed away a long time ago. It was more like a walking corpse than a living thing. I screamed, but all that came out was air, no sound. And then I ran back to my tent and hid under a blanket. Somehow I fell back asleep, because the next thing I knew, it was bright out, and we were getting ready to leave the area. Luckily for me, it was the last time I'd see that Wendigo again. Black Heart and Icy Eyes from Jurgen. Before I begin the story, I need to set the scene a little. During the events of this story, I was spending time at a cabin, more a cottage, in Ontario. The cottage was a part of a community of cottages, with there being 12 in total, all situated around a park making a semicircle. I was nine at the time, and while we were there, my older brother and I had made friends with an older kid, who was maybe 14, named Brandon. Now, Brandon was a weird kid, the type of child who you could tell was a constant source of disappointment for his parents who themselves I never got to meet. He never wanted to be with his parents, even going so far as to ignore their calls even late at night. Being a young kid, I couldn't fathom a person who wouldn't want to be close to their parents, but that could be because I was a bit of a goody two-shoes when I was younger. I didn't like Brandon too much, to be honest, but my brother did, and I worshipped my brother at the time, so I'd follow him anywhere. Unfortunately, my brother felt the same way about Brandon, so I was stuck with him. Eventually, Brandon got it in his head that he wanted to sneak out, and naturally my brother did the same. And because we shared a room, I came along too. At first, we just went to the park and hung out for a while. But then after that, it became obvious that we were all getting bored. I suggested we just go to bed, but obviously the older kids were going to call the shots and Brandon suggested we explored the woods. I protested again, but was immediately shot down. So off we went into the woods using the dim light of Brandon's phone to light the way. These woods weren't very thick. You could even hear the low rumble of the highway just a few miles away. After a few minutes of walking around, I wanted to return, but I was met with two options. Walk back in the dark or stay with them. After another few minutes, I noticed that the woods had gone silent. No crickets, no owls, no wind even. I pointed this out, and we all stopped and listened. After a couple of seconds of complete silence, the silence was broken by my brother, who looked at me and asked in an annoyed tone, Can you be quiet? I'm trying to listen. What? I didn't do anything, I protested. 
that heavy breathing like a dying pig. Keep it down. He shot back. Just as I was about to protest again, I heard the breathing too. Heavy, labored breathing. Very quietly, I said, That's not me. I can hear it too. My brother glanced at me. Suddenly the breathing got louder, like it was excited. Almost simultaneously, we all looked up. Above us was a pair of lights. They glowed a brilliant blue and swayed from side to side. We all stared, almost mesmerized, before we heard the most gut-wrenching moan I've ever heard in my life. It sounded like a lifelong smoker was trying to scream while being completely out of breath. That broke us from our trance, and we began to run. Behind us, we could hear the snapping of branches and trees shaking. Whatever it was, it had to have been in the trees. I've never been a strong runner, mainly due to my massive feet, so I knew I would not be able to run for long. Quickly, I felt pain all down my legs, and I needed to stop while my brother and Brandon ran ahead of me, leaving me behind. Still, that thing, whatever it was, swiftly approached, so I did the only thing I could. I dove into a bush to hide. Luck was clearly not with me, because the bush I jumped into was a thorn bush, and in moments, I was covered in cuts and scratches. I covered my mouth to prevent a pained cry, and as I sat there, I heard something heavy hit the forest floor. I watched from the bush as the two lights from earlier illuminated the tiny clearing I was in. The lights weren't lights at all, in fact, they were eyes. Those eyes lit up a creature that had been ripped straight from a nightmare. This creature stood about seven feet tall. It was skinny, and its skin was a dark gray. The skin itself clung onto the creature unnaturally tight. So tight I could see its stomach through the skin. Its arms were unnaturally long, ending in clawed hands. But by far the most disturbing part of the creature was its chest. The chest looked painful. The ribcage wrenched open. It looked like it had no sternum. The skin painfully stretched over the sharp ribs, but in the indent left where the sternum should have been, there was a black mass, which beat and pulsated. I couldn't get a good look at the thing's face. Its eyes were too bright to make anything out, but I knew it had a mouth because it was still breathing heavily. It stood in that clearing for a while, looking around, looking for me, and after what seemed like an eternity, it left. I stayed in that bush for hours. I didn't leave, not until I saw the sun coming up and fully past the horizon. After that, I did my best to run towards where I thought the cabin was. I didn't care that I was bleeding a lot, or my clothes were basically rags after that thorn bush. I even completely ignored the burning in my legs as I ran for what could have been hours until I finally saw a break in the trees. When I emerged, I found myself on a busy highway, and as I tumbled my way onto the road, I passed out. I woke up in a hospital. Apparently, someone saw me tumble out of the woods, covered in blood, in my torn pajamas. They brought me to a hospital. My parents came to pick me up soon after, and when I told them what happened, no one believed me. I insisted, but everyone assumed I'd spent too much time in the woods. While I was gone, my brother got home and waited until morning before he told them what happened. A search party had been made before they got the call to come pick me up. It's been over seven years since these events took place, and I've scoured the internet looking for something that matched this creature, but I found nothing. If anyone could help me identify it, I would very much appreciate it. Wendigo of Missouri, from Jin. I cannot recall the exact time of this event, but I think I was about 12 years old then. I was with my family at the Lake of the Ozarks in Missouri. We tend to go out there about every two years, pretty much a family tradition. So one year while we were there, we went to a different spot than usual. Normally we would stay in a rental condo by the lake, 
but this time we decided we'd go camping instead. Of course, me, being afraid of the woods, freaked out a little bit. I absolutely despised thick woods, especially ones that could potentially consist of bears and other wildlife. When the day came for us to leave, I said goodbye to my pets and my friend who was going to care for them while I was gone. I got in our car, waved goodbye, and we drove off. About two hours into the drive, I fell asleep. When I woke up, I heard the car coming to a stop. We'd driven into a gas station practically in the middle of nowhere. Everyone was going inside to use the bathroom, but me, on the other hand, I stayed in the car. As I lay there in the passenger seat, a wave of unease set over me. I looked out the window of the car, and I saw this tall shadow just disappearing into the trees. I figured it was some sort of moose or bear, minding its own business. About three hours later, we'd finally arrived at the campsite. I got out and saw that we had an amazing view of the lake and the mountains around. We all helped unpack the luggage we'd brought with us. Since it was already dinner time, we sat down together at a metal bench next to our tent while my aunt and my mother cooked us all a meal. As I sat and waited for the food to get done, I noticed a cute little rabbit by the forest line. I smiled, watching it chew on some grass, but with a blur, a tall figure passed over the rabbit, and the rabbit was gone. It happened so fast, I was oblivious to what that thing was, but still I excused it like before. Maybe it was a bear, even a hawk? Heck, the rabbit probably just ran off. I turned back around to eat and didn't mention this to anyone, mostly because they probably wouldn't believe that the thing I saw was that fast, if I'd seen anything at all. Later on, after dinner, we all sat around the campfire telling scary stories. When it came time for my turn, I had no ideas, so I excused myself to my tent to go to bed. Honestly, I really was tired from that five-hour trip. As I lay on my air mattress, something smelled absolutely horrible. I began looking around the tent, and to my horror, I found a dead raccoon resting behind my mattress. I yelped, trying to get away from the dead thing. I went back out to the campfire to tell my mom about this raccoon. She decided to use some gloves to carry it to the trees. After this occurrence, I really didn't want to sleep anymore, in fear that whatever had killed the poor thing was still nearby. I did eventually fall asleep, peacefully resting my overwhelmed mind. What must have been around half an hour later, I suddenly woke up and I felt as if someone was watching me. I noticed that all the sounds of nature sounded muted. I looked at the tent door and realized it was open, but it hadn't been before. At first I was pretty scared to look, but after gaining some confidence I glanced outside the tent. What I saw, I will honestly never forget. Standing there was a dark figure, probably around eight feet tall. I looked up at its face, but only saw a deer skull and antlers. I screamed as loud as possible, trying to alert everyone about the danger. I kept screaming, not letting my eyes off the creature. After about five seconds, it ran off into the forest. In that instant, my parents came running out of the tent with the most worried looks on their faces. I was in tears at that point, breaking down into their arms. The next day, we immediately left that place, returning home. Of course, I didn't tell my parents what I actually saw. They would never believe me. Instead, I said that a bear had been trying to get inside my tent. Let's just say I'm never going there again. At least, not any time soon. The Creature in the Clearing From Koalas.co This experience is why I never go outside at night alone. I live in Canada, and I moved to the countryside recently to get away from the city. It's been almost three years without incident, but in the past three months of posting this, things have begun to happen. I live on 103 acres of mostly woods, with paths, trails, and all that good stuff. My house sits in the middle of a clearing, and a stairway leads up to my front porch. Off to the left of the stairs, walking from the door is the grassy part of the clearing, with trailers filled with my grandfather's things, the main floor and the basement. 
Now on to some of the things that happen. I'll wake up in the night and go to the kitchen, which is close to my room, just across the hall. Keep in mind, the whole house is an open concept for the most part. Anyway, as I pass the living room, there's this huge thing. Not a person, not an animal of any sort. It's a no-face creature, about nine feet tall. No arms, no legs, no ears, no facial features. It seemed to be just floating there, staring at an outdated world map. That was extremely creepy and bizarre. On other occasions, from the corner of my vision, I've seen things I like to call wisps, like small shadows fluttering past. Now here's why I'll never go outside alone at night again. I typically listen to the night creatures on the porch, and I go inside after a few minutes. However, on one of these occasions, something grabbed my ankle on the poorly lit stairs. When I felt it happen, I moved to the front door faster than I thought possible. Before going back in, I happened to glance out at the clearing. I saw this thing. It was as tall as the trailers. You know, the type she put on the back of the 12-wheeler trucks. It had the head of a deer and the body of a person. This thing also had tusks and glowing red eyes. Quickly, I went inside and locked the door behind me, and I hid under some blankets. After a few minutes, I heard this strange noise, and my cat ran to the window. I gathered the courage to uncover myself and look. My heart sank. There are some bushes with a small walkway out my window. What I saw there was a little girl's shadow, but those same glowing eyes. I hid myself back under that blanket. In the morning, I said nothing to my parents. But my brother, however, made my heart stop. When we were alone that next day, he asked me if I'd seen the dear man with red eyes. I asked him what it looked like. He told me every detail of the thing that I'd seen. Then he said it turned into a girl, and it vanished. So now I knew I wasn't hallucinating, and I told him, yeah, I saw it too. We decided together that we'd tell our parents, but they didn't believe us, telling us to stop pranking them, and they went back to eating breakfast. The basement also scares me, mainly because I always feel like I'm being watched in there, even if I'm alone, and I swear I saw two red eyes out of the corner of my eye. Nowadays, I turn on all the lights in there before entering the room. My final piece of the story was just a few hours ago as of writing this. I was doing my chores like every other day, throwing out the litter and the compost area, and as I was looking at my feet while walking back to the house, I noticed something weird. I wasn't casting a shadow. I stopped and began to move around, and no matter what I did, I did not see my shadow appear. I laughed at first, but now looking back at it, I have no idea what to make of it. There's something seriously wrong with this place. The Quiet Being at Wolf Creek From O. Merlin O. In a small town of East Texas, I was about 14 years old. It was the summer of my sophomore year in high school. I usually like to walk around my neighborhood at night due to it being quiet, and there were no disturbances with it being a gated neighborhood. Not a typical subdivision, though. It was mildly spaced out, and my parents owned a decent nine acres, I think. The owner of the neighborhood had a large portion of land that took up the majority of the gated neighborhood, and there was a creek called Wolf Creek. It separated half of it. I was used to taking trips through the creek by myself, and occasionally I'd bring friends with me during the day. I would never go in the woods at night, and typically, my night walks, I was by myself. I was always confident going out in the dark, but I always had an uncomfortable feeling in the back of my head to keep me from being too comfortable out there. I was fully aware that strange things happen to people sometimes. One night, I was on one of my walks, decompressing from the thoughts of my dog passing away that past year. I went to visit her grave. We buried her at the edge of the property not too far from the house. 
I could see our sunroom light, which I knew my mother left on so it illuminated part of the backyard, which I could see when I came up to the house. I sat down with my back up to our metal black fence that faced the creek. Between the fence and the creek was a dirt road. I sat there for nearly 20 minutes. The air sat still, along with the chirping of critters in the night. Somewhat calming to me, yet that feeling in the back of my mind was uneasy, like a quick reminder that I shouldn't be too comfortable. Not long after that, I heard a rustle of rocks from the dirt road just behind me. A chill came over me. It was certainly not what I ever expected to experience in my life. I turned around quick, only to find a still humanoid figure standing there, just staring at me. It had a curious look on its face. Its eyes were large and black, and it had a light brown and gray skin color. There was no lip definition, so it didn't look like it had any mouth to it. It was no taller than myself, and I was about five foot ten. Its limbs appeared to be bony. It continued to stare at me for what seemed like forever. Finally, at some point, it proceeded to take a step forward, reaching for the fence in front of me. It slightly opened its mouth, like it was going to speak to me. But before anything else could happen, I ran. I ran harder than ever before, with tears rolling down my face. My heart pounded, and my body felt cold, like opening up a freezer door in a warm room. I made it back to my house no problem. I bolted inside, yelling for my dad to grab his gun. Puzzled, he trusted my demand, because it was something I would never just run into the house for at night. We power walked outside, to find nothing there. No footprints, no tracks in the dew of the grass except for my own boots. My dad wanted to know what was going on. I explained to him what I saw. My mother was outside at the same time, as she was also concerned. They wanted to believe every bit of what I'd said. After all, I was pale in the face like I'd seen a ghost. But my mother tried shrugging it off, saying that I saw some homeless man. But I knew what I saw that night, and I still get chills when I think about it. It was so real, and it all happened so quick. To this day, I'm still curious as to what's out there and it doesn't bother me that we're not alone in this world. Looking back, I wouldn't have mind staying there a bit longer, just to find out what would have happened. But everything in my body at the time screamed for me to run. Those Eyes From Ian L This happened to me a little over a year ago. I lived in Texas most of my life, so you know we were heavily armed. The area of Texas I lived in was pretty much known for coyotes. I won't say the area for safety reasons. The neighborhood I lived in pretty much backed up to a wooded area where they all would stay during the day, but they would come out to hunt during the night. I don't know much about them besides the noises they make, as I heard them almost every night, but they would always seem to hunt together, like a pack of friends, just having fun going fishing. They would sometimes snatch up dogs and cats in the neighborhood, and every now and then a horse from one of the ranchers that lived nearby. As for us, our house was at the bottom of a hill, placed where if I walked out the back, I could walk up the hill and see a sunset full 360 degrees around, besides the part that was all woods, so more like 270 degrees. Often I'd wake up in the middle of a night for a drink, as I would be thirsty around 2-3 to 3 a.m., because of this, I would see the window at the back of my house. On occasion, I would look out while I'm getting a drink, because I love the view. But one night was different. On that night, I woke up around 2.15, give or take. I walked into the kitchen to go get myself a water, like usual. But something was off. I felt as if I was being watched. I thought it was just my imagination at first. But then, I pinpointed the reason for the feeling. Looking out of my window, I saw a single coyote staring at me from the top of the hill. I could see its silhouette even in the pitch blackness. I stared at it, curious as to why of all places to look, it was staring at me, at my house. 
It was almost like a staring contest, but it was bigger than a usual coyote. Or at least it appeared that way from what I could tell. I didn't really pay much mind to it, as there were tons of coyotes out there. But its eyes. There was something off about its eyes. Even from that distance, which was maybe 100 yards, its eyes appeared yellowish red, but there was no light for its eyes to reflect. After about 10 minutes of this staring contest, I snapped back to reality and finished my drink, placing it in the sink and going to bed. The following night, the same thing happened. I saw those same yellowish red eyes at the same spot. Over and over for a month or so, it continued to happen. But then one day, it just stopped. For about another week, I didn't see it again. During the time that it wasn't there, I felt at ease, as if a burden had been lifted from my shoulders. But a few days after that, it came back. But this time, it wasn't alone. There was a second one, same position, same size, if not a little bigger than the last. But this one's eyes were different. These eyes were yellowish red like the first, but they seemed frosted over, as if this one was blind. I didn't stick around for a drink that night. I went right back to bed. The next day, my parents had told me that because of everything going on with the Rona, we were going to have to downsize to a smaller home in case my dad's job went bad and his pay got cut or worse. Luckily, since it was still a newer area, they were building new homes across this town, and one was in the same neighborhood as this one. It wasn't even half the size, but nonetheless, it was still a very nice home. From this house, I couldn't see the hill, but I could still hear those coyotes. This brought me ease, as if I was at peace again. This peace carried on for months. Everything went good, and I almost forgot about the encounters altogether. One night, my parents were going to take a date night over at the casino, which they would have to drive to Oklahoma for, so they'd be gone for quite a while. My brother was off in boot camp for the military, so I'd be home alone for the entire day. So I did what any reasonable high school kid would do. I played video games and ate pizza rolls all day. It was a good day. Video games, some friends, no parents to tell me what to do. Life was good and all that. At a certain point, I got up to close my blinds. After all, it was getting dark. I was home and completely alone, so I got up to get the last of my very healthy junk food and coke, and I began to walk back to my room. But suddenly, I stopped in my tracks. Slowly, I looked at my back door. I couldn't see much because of how dark it was, but I felt as if I was being watched, almost the same feeling I had with the coyote from before. But this was different. Somehow it was darker and more sinister. But I couldn't look away. It was like I was stuck in a constant staring contest with something, but our eyes were chained together. Out of nowhere, my cat hissed, and it broke me from my shackles. I ran over, locking the door. I turned around quickly, but as soon as I got back to my hallway, I heard a bang, bang, bang. Someone was taking their palm and smashing it against the back window. I ran to my room, turning off my lights and TV, everything that made any sort of light or sound. I lay on the ground flat, so whoever or whatever it was couldn't see me if they peeked in. At first, I heard nothing. Silence. But before I began to move again, I heard shuffling coming from my backyard, going to my room's window. The way the footsteps sounded, it was as if its legs were too heavy to completely pick up. They were dragging across the ground, and I could hear something muttering, or maybe it was gasping for air or whispering or something. It sounded garbled. It was then I realized it couldn't be my friend playing a prank on me. I covered my mouth to keep any noise from slipping out. My intruder made it to my window. It then went quiet, no longer moving or trying to talk. My blinds were luckily closed, but these weren't very good blinds in the first place. These were those modern white blinds that you pull the handle and they flip, so each had a slit between each piece, and because of this and the angle I was lying down at, I could see right outside. I looked towards my bedroom door, then back at the window, 
and nearly threw up. Whatever was out there, it was staring right back at me through one of these slits. Those yellowish red eyes from before now stood at a height of seven or eight feet, peering down at me. It knew exactly where I was at. It could see me like it was daytime for it. When I tried to move, its hideous eyes followed me wherever I crawled to. I couldn't look away. The longer I stared into its eyes, the more evil it felt. I couldn't even see its face, but I knew it was smiling at me from ear to ear. I felt my insides turning, my soul being squeezed from my body, but I still could not look away. I could hear it beginning to snicker under its disgusting gurgling and troubled breathing. I felt like this was it, but something snapped me out of my trance. I regained my composure, grabbing my phone without staring into the eyes again and called my parents. I told them there was a man outside my window. I was near tears at this point. They told me they were on the way home and they were almost there. I hung up, getting up, but I looked into the eyes again by mistake. Instead, this time, I felt enraged, like all I could see was red. I grabbed a gun and I started to make my way outside, but as soon as my hand touched the door handle, I stopped. My rage faded and I fell to my knees, cuddling up into a corner, waiting for my parents to get home. Luckily, they made it back. I have no idea where that figure went. A few weeks later, we moved to Florida. My dad had received a job offer. I was so relieved. I've never seen that thing again, and I hope I never do. Whatever that was, it was no coyote, and it was far from any man. Pale Gray Humanoid Encounter in the Wyoming Rockies From Sea Philly 100 this story was told to me by my friend, but it's pretty wild, so I thought I'd share it here, told from his perspective. I was camping in the Wind River Range in Wyoming, which is coincidentally the highest range in the state. I was getting ready to go to sleep in my car at the trailhead when I saw SAR leaving. They let me know they'd been searching for a hiker who had been reported missing for 24 hours. They said they had to turn back now, though, due to a big winter storm system moving through the area. Before leaving, they said they'd be back in the morning, but to be on the lookout. I said I would, but my hopes were rather low for his survival at this point in time. I set out bright and early the next morning. It had snowed about a foot overnight. My objective was Mount Gannett, which is the tallest peak in the Wind River Range, at 13,804 feet or so. I had my snowshoes on, but it was still rather slow going. I was taking in the natural beauty and enjoying myself when I noticed some fresh tracks in the snow. These were human. They were plowing straight through the trees and bushes and everything else in a straight line. Thinking it might be the missing hiker, I decided to follow them. I'd only gone about 400 yards or so when I thought I heard a familiar sound. It sounded like a baby crying. My human instinct took over, and I started in the direction from whence I'd heard the sound. What struck me as odd, however, was that the pitch never changed. It sounded almost like a recording of a baby crying played on a loop or something. I looked up just in time to see something dart behind a tree. I became a bit confused at that point as I could no longer hear the baby crying, and I wasn't entirely sure what I was doing there anymore. I went to turn around, when something once again caught my eye. Something stepped out from behind a tree. It looked like a pale humanoid creature. The best thing I can think to compare it to would be that white orc from the Lord of the Rings and Hobbit series, although it didn't look exactly like that. The face was similar. No nose and this look of total hatred and malice. It had this sinister grin on its face that seemed to say, that's it, I've got you. It was about six or seven feet tall and extremely muscular. It didn't appear to have any hair or male or female parts. 
It began to walk through the snow, seemingly without any resistance at all. It never broke direct eye contact with me. The only motion seemed to be a slight bobbing up and down. Other than that, it was very intentional with its movements. I started stumbling backwards, tripping over my snowshoes in my attempt to turn around. I heard a gunshot then, looking up to see an SAR officer wielding a pump-action shotgun. The creature screamed like a banshee before leaping back out of sight, leaving a slight trail of thick, dark blood in its path. The officer ran over, helping me to my feet. He radioed that he'd found someone in such and such part of the grid. We made our way back to the trailhead together. We were met by someone on a snowcat. The officer said he'd shot a bear that had been charging me. He looked at me, though, knowingly, and I figured I'd trust his intuition. I mean, who would believe there had been a tall, hairless, pale, white man out there preying on people? It turns out the other guy, who had actually been missing, had spent the night on the mountain, hunkered down in a hollow. He had made his way, albeit somewhat unorthodoxly, back down to the trailhead. I am immensely grateful to these volunteers, to whom I owe my life. To all of you listening or reading this, be careful if you're heading out into the Wyoming Rockies. There's something out there, and I have a feeling that shotgun didn't do much to slow it down. Under the Floor From George 1997 This happened to me, my brother, and our girlfriends. I was 23 at the time, and after this, my brother and I convinced my dad to sell the place. It was a Tuesday, and I had a week off work. My younger brother had recently been fired from his retail job. He got fired because he was taking some overly long smoke breaks. We decided to take our girlfriends up to our father's cabin for a few days. It's located around Gravenhurst, Ontario. It's a pretty cool area. The cabin was about 25 minutes from town and 15 minutes from our closest neighbors. Basically, it was nice and remote. A private area. Or so we thought. We left Toronto around 5 a.m., and we got to the cabin around 8 a.m. I drove up in my old 95 Chevy Tahoe. My girlfriend, Marie, was in the passenger seat. My brother Mike and his girlfriend, Anne, were in the back. The cabin itself was a small raised cabin. Two bedroom, one bathroom. Outside, there was a parking area, some field area, a small fire pit with benches, and the woods beyond, as well as a good-sized half-work shed, half-garage building about 40 feet away from the cabin. Our mom and dad built it that far so she wouldn't have to hear the tomfoolery that went on from another of my dad's projects. But my dear old dad hadn't been up to the cabin much since our mom passed away from cancer a few years back. At 8 a.m. we unloaded the coolers and our tied down bags from off the truck and went up the steps, unlocking the old wooden door and we went inside to make some breakfast. Marie and I claimed the larger bedroom being the older brother comes with some perks. After frying up some bacon and eggs, peppers and onions, and toast, putting together our westerns, we sat on the futon couches in the living room, talking and enjoying the morning. After breakfast, I wanted to relax for a while with my girlfriend. We went to our room and took a nap until about 1pm. Then we went out to the fire pit where Mike and Anne had apparently spent the remainder of the morning together, smoking and stirring their small campfire. We sat around the fire for a while. Anne and Mike were arguing about something at some point. Anne claimed she saw something a few hours ago hiding behind the garage. She said it was a short, skinny, dark, shadowy man peeking out from a corner of the garage. But Mike was convinced she was just trying to freak him out, or that she just saw one of the pine trees swaying in the wind over near the garage. But Anne was adamant, angrily going back into the cabin. Nice going, bro, I said, patting him on the back. He shook his head and lit another cigarette, complaining to Marie and I before we went on to other topics. Suddenly, we heard a scream coming from the cabin. We all stood up and turned to see Anne waving her arms for us to come inside from the large window. We looked to each other and shrugged, 
then threw some dirt on the fire before walking back into the cabin. Despite Anne's urgent waves, we weren't really in a hurry. Once inside, she locked the door behind us and demanded to be taken home. We asked what she was on about. She explained she saw it again, this black figure. She saw it on the deck through the glass door. It crawled off of the deck and underneath the house. She could even hear it scratching at the floor right where she stood, and that's what made her scream. My brother and I were thinking maybe it was a possum or skunk, that she had scared it so it ran off under the house. We were about to go out to sea, but she stopped us, saying it was too dangerous. We convinced her it was probably some small critter just living under the cabin. We tried to get her to calm down, but she got us to stay indoor the rest of the day playing old board games like Scrabble. We snacked and drank some beers from the cooler. Around 10 p.m., when we were about to go to bed, we heard the scratching Anne had described before. It certainly was coming from under the floor in the hallway. It seemed to be making its way to where we were in the living room. Anne grabbed tightly onto Mike's arm, terror in her eyes, but Mike, Marie, and I were unfazed. I suggested we go out and scare whatever was under the house with some flashlights, bang some sticks together, and make some noise. Mike interrupted that idea by slamming his feet on the floor. The scratching suddenly stopped for a minute. But then it came back, more vicious than before. Annoyed, I got up to go outside, but when I was putting on my shoes and looking out the windows, I saw dark shapes moving in the field and around the cabin. I said out loud, What the heck? I grabbed a flashlight and pressed both my face and the flashlight against the glass. There must have been around eight shadowy figures roaming around the cabin. I managed to catch one of their legs in the light of my flashlight, but it was still too fast. From what I saw, the leg was black and leathery against the green grass. Then one of those creatures slammed right up against the glass where my face was. I flew back, everyone screaming behind me. Outside, we heard screeches surrounding the building. Some came from under the house, too. Some were even on top of the roof. There was banging on the walls and scratching everywhere. I ran into the larger bedroom, grabbing the rifle my dad kept in the closet. Then I ran back into the living room, aiming it at the floor, where I'd heard one of those things scratching. At the same time, my brother, Anne, and Marie had acquired knives from the kitchen. They'd huddled on top of the coffee table that was struggling under their combined weight. I fired off a shot at the floor. Right after that, I heard a screech and scuttering away. I reloaded and repeated this until there was silence outside the cabin. What do we do? Mike said. Get the heck out of here. Marie and Anne both said in different ways. I held a hand up for them to be quiet not convinced that these weird things were all gone. I looked out the windows again, and I could see things moving in the trees across the field. They were still out there, waiting. I told them what I saw. We stayed inside the cabin for hours, unsure of whether to stay or leave. Eventually, I stopped seeing movement in the trees, so we quietly and quickly packed up our things. The truck was only 10 feet away from the front door. I shone the flashlight around it and into the neighboring woods to make sure we were all clear. It seemed clear. So after locking the cabin door, we made a mad dash for the truck, throwing our stuff inside. We locked the truck doors too and started the engine. When the truck lights turned on, lighting up the driveway, we spotted one of those things running across the road. Taking a deep breath, I put the truck into drive. It jolted forward as I stepped on the gas heavily. Going down the driveway and out onto the road, we saw movement everywhere. The forest seemed to be crawling with shadows. I was so terrified. My eyes burned. I didn't want to shut them for a minute. We turned onto the main road, where I saw one of those things sitting on the road. I pressed on the gas and went over 90 on the dirt road, and I aimed right for it but when I passed over it, it just stood up on bent limbs and slowly walked away. 
its eyes never reflecting any light, like gray pools on the all-black leathery-looking thing. It watched us leave. We didn't stop until we were back in the city. It was around 6 a.m. then when we pulled up into the apartment complex. Honestly, we were surprised we weren't pulled over by how fast I was going. After that, we went up and fell asleep in my apartment, absolutely exhausted. My brother and I don't like talking about what happened back then, and our girlfriends broke up with us weeks later after that. We talked our father into selling the cabin after months of convincing, and I would like to say it's over, but it's not. I still have nightmares where I'm stuck in that cabin, and those things are scratching at the walls and floor. When they finally break through, I wake up. I want to know what they are. I want closure. I am tempted to go back every few years to see if they're still there or if they moved on. Why did they choose to come after us? I want to know. Maybe someone can hear my description and know what these things are and why they came after four young adults just looking for a peaceful trip in the woods. Here's the description from me and my brother combined. They were black and leathery looking, about four and a half to five feet tall, with about four claw-like fingers and toes. They had gray, large eyes that don't reflect light, with a skinny body and limbs. They crawled around but sometimes would stand up on two legs. Their back legs were bent the wrong way. We couldn't really see the mouth from how far they were from us, but the screeching made our eardrums shake with how loud it was. They're fast and hard to see, and they waited until night to come after us as a pack. If you know what these monstrous things are, please, let us know. I have to know. It Watches As You Sleep From Anonymous It was November 2021 on a school day. I remember my friend and I were hanging out this particular morning. At the time, I was a junior at school, and things were finally back to normal after the Rona situation. I had just finished softball practice, and I had about an hour until the first period, and my friend wanted to go to Duncan's. So I thought, why not? Little did I know this decision would change my beliefs and open my eyes. Now Duncan's was just across the street from my school, but my friend wanted to take a detour through the woods to hit her vape. We get to her usual spot, and I walked off the path a little to let her do her thing. I was there for a good while. That's when I heard some sort of shuffling through the leaves. Right away, I felt odd. There was something eerie about it, and it became downright unsettling when I heard someone say, Come here. I ignored it and quickly went back to my friend. I told her we should leave and forget about Duncan's, so we did. The day passed by, and at the end of the school day, I felt comfortable enough to go back through the woods. However, I soon regretted this. The whole way home, I kept hearing heavy footsteps behind me, like I was being followed by someone. So, I began to run. As I did, I could hear breathing, and I swear at one point, I felt that breathing down my neck. I never looked back. I didn't want to see what it was. I'll admit I was scared, so that night I went to bed and I locked my bedroom door. I wasn't allowed to lock my door at night in case of emergencies, but I double-checked and I know for sure it was locked. I felt safer. I went to sleep, but at some point in the night I woke up. At first I wasn't sure why until I heard this low growl in my room. Then I nearly gagged, because I could smell something like rotting flesh. I looked around my room to see where it was coming from, and I noticed my door was wide open. Slowly, my eyes made their way to the corner of the room, and I saw this thing. Something inside told me it was the same thing that had been torturing me all day. I wanted to leave, but I couldn't bring myself to move. How long had it been there watching me sleep? It had pale yellow eyes reflecting from what little light there was. Unblinkingly, they stared at me. It was almost touching the ceiling with how tall it was, and I could see yellow sharp teeth as it smiled. 
It had this sickly looking white bony body. It almost looked human, but all wrong. As I looked into its eyes, I could feel my heart in my throat. Eventually, I was able to will myself into slowly getting out of bed. I walked to the door, my eyes never leaving that thing. Once I reached the doorway, I screamed and I ran to my parents' room. I explained what I saw, but when my parents ran to my room to check, it was gone. They told me I had to have been dreaming and that they would talk about it in the morning. But I know what I saw and I know I was awake. Since then, I've never seen anything like it again, but I still have no idea what it was. I wonder why it just stood there and watched me. I know it could have killed me if it wanted to. Maybe it was some kind of forest demon that followed me home. Most of the people I share this story with say I made it up, but I wish I did. I don't care if they believe me or not. I will say, though, that I'll never be taking any shortcuts through the woods again. Thank you for listening to another unsettling episode of Unexplained Encounters. You can send us your story to have it narrated on the show at darkstories.org. Unexplained Encounters is an EerieCast original series. You can find other horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com, such as Redwood Bureau, a fictional anthology series, Freaky Folklore, a documentary-style series about myths and cryptids around the world, Destination Terror, a show about the most haunted places, and Tales from the Break Room, another show I host all about the scary things that happen to people at work. Again, that's EerieCast.com. By the way, if you want fewer annoying ads and you want to support what we do, consider going to EerieCast.com slash plus to sign up for EerieCast Plus. That unlocks all our podcasts with all but host red ads removed. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.